Thank you, Senator. Please go back here. Council of Buffalo, we are live now, so you can so you can start the meeting uh, whenever you want. Okay, I was just waiting for Olia to join us. We'll just let her in when she gets in. Yeah, I've got the link now, so I'm there. Oh, you're here? There you are. Good. Yeah, I don't know why my mother's name is showing up, but that's not her. <laughs> okay, great. So I'm going to call this meeting of the Grimsby Heritage Advisory Committee to order. It's uh, for Tuesday, January the 11th, 2022, the first one of the new year. Welcome everybody to 2022, and hopefully it'll be a better year for everybody. I'm going to do the land acknowledgement first. So the town of Grimsby is situated on treaty land. This land is steeped in the rich history of the First Nations, such as the Hadawenda Rock, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. There are many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people from across Turtle Island that live and work in Niagara today. The town of Grimsby stands with all Indigenous people, past and present, in promoting the wise stewardship of the lands on which we live. Before I go to approval of agenda, I'm just going to have uh, planning staff, uh, Bianca, would just like to make a little bit of an announcement. Bianca? Thank you, um, Councillor Bothwell, through the chair. I'd like to do a quick introduction um, and introduce Garrett to everyone. So Garrett France Wiley is our new heritage intern. Uh, Garrett's background is in building construction. He also attended Willowbank School of Restoration Arts, uh, where he studied heritage conservation and heritage planning, as well as attending the Princess, uh, the Princess Foundation Summer School in England to further pursue his passion for heritage conservation and traditional building trades. Garrett has successfully ran his own heritage carpentry business, France Wiley Restoration, since 2017, and has completed many restoration projects, including works on designated properties and national historic sites in, located in Ontario, France, and, U, and the UK. Uh, we are very excited to have Garrett join our team. He is a master of restoring wooden windows, so we look forward to having him lead um, a seminar in the future for heritage homeowners. So we're very excited to have Garrett on our team. And um, yeah, thank you, uh, Garrett, for joining the team. We're looking forward to having you here. Um, I'll pass it back to Councillor Bothwell. Thank you, Bianca. Welcome, Garrett. Uh, great to have you. I think it'll be a thank fun- Thank you, happy to be here. Awesome. So now I'm gonna to go to number three, approval of the agenda. Um, so we have a number of changes to the agenda that are that we're putting forward. So uh, we'd like to move the um, delegate the okay. So first of all, I'm going to move uh, the closed session item to following the de uh, following the delegation seven a. We'll put in closed session item eleven, and following that, we'll move to the. Uh, Report HG 2201-9A immediately. So we'll move 9A up following the closed session because they're all connected with the same topic with respect to 133 Main Street East. And then we'll move the verbal budget update, uh, 9G verbal update on the budget, um, sorry, prior to the delegation. So following election of chair and vice chair, number six, we'll do the verbal update on the budget. So prior to delegations, we'll do the delegation, then we'll have a closed session, and then we'll move to the report on uh, 9A report. Um, if everyone's good with that and no further changes, I've got a motion resolved that the January 11, 2022 Heritage Grimsby Advisory Meeting agenda be approved with the amendments that I noted. All in favor? I need a mover and a seconder first. Can I have a mover, Pamela? Can I have a seconder, please? Uh, Sarah, thank you. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Uh, so disclosures of interest. Do we have any disclosures of interest with respect to the agenda in front of us tonight? Seeing none, I'm gonna do five previous minutes. So this is nice to see back in the agenda, Peter. I'm pleased to see that the Heritage Grimsby Advisory Committee minutes are being received. Um, so, 
they're now going to be a standing addition to the agenda, which I think we should have probably had way back, but it's good to see them back. And it also gives uh, the committee an opportunity to understand that, Peter, maybe you can confirm that the draft minutes will be circulated to the committee members prior to Committee of the Whole um, in advance, hopefully a number of days in advance, so that members can review the minutes and provide any corrections or additions prior to it going to Committee of the Whole. So. Um, Peter, can you just confirm that that's going to be our new process moving forward? Thank you, through you, Chair. Uh, so this will be a standing item. However, the so the minutes will be circulated to members, um, but it it will go to the committee of the whole uh, meeting, likely prior to the heritage meeting taking place, uh, just due to the scheduling. So we didn't want to hold up the minutes coming to committee of the whole uh, in case there's. Uh, pending matters like heritage permits or anything like that, that requires approval. So I just uh, thought that in, in discussion that we would be getting the draft minutes circulated to the committee. So we're able to make corrections rather than me on the day of a committee of the whole at the noon hour when we receive the minutes, having to review them myself <laughs> and bring up- That's any correct. Questions. Yes, sorry, through you chair, that's my understanding as well, that they'll be uh, circulated in draft. draft. Okay. Okay, that's all that's all I want to confirm because I don't want to be the only pair of eyes looking at them on the day of a committee of the whole meeting and having to say, oops, there's a you know, the motion needs a little bit of refinement or so so committee members should look to their emails to watch for the draft. And I would ask if you could kindly review those draft minutes prior to committee of the whole and, and provide me and, and Peter with any changes or amendments or corrections that you see. Thank you. So in front of us we have um the uh olia uh do you have a question or uh you got your hand up there just in regards to the november minutes i had sent an email in i think it was to peter and bianca um earlier this week asking for a correction of the spelling of my name in the november minutes and as well that the attendance be corrected uh, in regards to the leave of absence that was approved back in june so that would have reflected september october november minutes so i haven't received a response to that other than I did see the location updated for the October, November minutes, which also was indicated in my email as uh, not visible uh, to the general public. So I'm just hoping to get a confirmation from either Peter or Bianca that those corrections will be made with respect to my, the spelling of my name and the attendance for September, October, and November's minutes, please and thank you. Uh, Peter, you wanna? Yes, thank you through you, Chair. Uh, so we did make the correction to the, the location um, in terms of the spelling of the name, I'll definitely reflect that in the minutes. Uh, and just, I apologize if, if uh, I just need clarification. What was the issue with the attendance? So as I had indicated in my email, uh, my attendance for those three meetings was indicated as absent. Uh, in the past, when someone has notified uh, staff ahead of time that they wouldn't be present at a meeting, that's been reflected as regrets. Um, and so I was hoping to have consistent treatment of that reflected in those three sets of minutes regarding my attendance. So just uh, we'll note that um, Olia was on an approved leave of absence approved by this committee. So I think it's just important that it's, it's I guess she's asking that it be noted in a manner that is recognizing that, that it's basically was approved by the committee and that's the regrets were, um, uh, following that approval. So Peter, I'll leave it with you to to look at how to best reflect that, uh, make that correction. And uh, welcome back, Olia. We're really glad to have you back as well. So I think, um, uh, anyway, yeah, we're really glad to have you back. Thank you. So Thanks. are you okay with that if we let Peter work out that, uh, how he's going to make that change for you? Yeah, of course. Okay. Um, so then what I'll, what I'll say is we will receive that the, we will resolve that the November 23rd, 2021 Heritage Grimsby Advisory Committee meeting minutes be received as amended, I'll say. Can I have a mover and a seconder for that? Uh, Anne and Mayor Jordan, thank you. All in favor? That's carried, thank you. So now we've got the election of chair and vice chair. This is the fun stuff. So um, our terms of reference says that we will elect a chair and a vice chair annually, um, and we're due, we're in a new calendar year. So um, what I will ask is we'll first work with nominations for chair. Um, so I will ask if there are any interested members of the committee who'd like to put their name forward for chair. Okay. 
Okay, so do I see any hands like waving wildly? No. So, okay, so I'll put my hand up. Um, so I will self nominate <laughs> for one more year because I believe the chair can serve two terms. So, um, Peter, does that mean we'll, I guess we vote on chair or is it acclamation? Three, three new chair. Um, we can include your name in the motion. Uh, there, I think the motions are provided there in the resolution. If we could also get a, a name for the vice chair, and then we'll just need a mover and seconder on that motion, and then we okay. can put it to a vote. That makes sense. So now I need a vice chair. Come on. It's not that hard. Kate, are you, are you putting your hand up there to be vice chair for another term? Do you want to unmute so I can hear the words if, come out of your mouth? No, if no one else wants to put their name forward, um, I absolutely would. Um, it's a great learning experience, a, a foot in the door to um, for a new person. But um, I absolutely would take the vice chair if nobody else is is you know ready to take it. Do we have any other takers? Going once, <laughs> going twice. Okay, so Kate, it looks like you're it on the motion. Okay, thank you. So we have, the motion is uh, resolved that me, Dorothy Bothwell, be appointed as chair and Kate Shero as vice chair for 2022. Can I have a mover and a seconder? Uh, Pamela and Sarah. All in favor? Thank you, everybody. Much appreciated. So now um, this is where we're going to move to budget. Am I right, Peter? Is this Melanie? That is correct. Okay. Good evening, committee. I, I'm Melanie Steele. Um, I'm the treasurer, the interim treasurer for the town of Grimsby. So I'm happy to be here tonight to talk to you a little bit about um, the budget, particularly as it relates to heritage and, and hear any feedback or discussion you might all have on that. I'm going to ask, I think, is it Bianca or Peter to throw up uh, a few slides um, to guide the conversation? Thank you. So before we jump into, there's a, a few schedules here that are a draft version of the Heritage Committee budget as it stands today, which we're looking to incorporate into the town's consolidated budget, which will be presented to council for consideration and approval in February. Um, um, before I jump into some of the details and, and walk you through some of the, the changes or the numbers that you're going to see in this draft budget, I just wanna make a few opening comments. Um, the budget strategy that we've adopted as a whole for the corporation in 2022 um, was received by council in December, and we laid out three main facets to that strategy. We really wanted to acknowledge the realities of the pandemic um, that we continue to see, and, and obviously everyone's aware, I don't need to, to dwell on it, that um, our 2022 uh, start of the year is continuing to be heavily impacted by the pandemic and it's impacting our operations and, and our costs. Um, we wanted to make sure that we were very mindful of that, that we didn't um, put any undue pressure on to Grimsby taxpayers while we're still trying to navigate recovery out of the pandemic. So our strategy was to be very mindful of that, maintain service. So we wanted to make sure that all the valued services that are being provided continue to be provided. We needed to incorporate existing commitments, some of which were, were significant, um, and present no service cuts. So our commitment to council is we would try to achieve that budget with no service cuts, maintaining that service and layering in our commitments. We also wanted to make sure that we did this with a modest levy increase that is below inflation. So, so that was our commitment and that's what we worked with as a whole, as a corporation. Some of the large corporate investments or commitments that we had to address with this budget was a compensation strategy that was approved by council in November. 
This was a comprehensive look at all compensation across the entire organization. It was a project that took us almost nine months to complete um, and council provided uh, full support for that strategy in November. So we've incorporated the results of that review into our corporate budgets. And, and you will see that, that that does shift our salary and compensation um, in, in all the different areas across the corporation by, by differing levels, but it was a significant investment for the corporation. Um, and we were looking to ensure that we accommodated that as our first priority. We also had some other significant pressures to address as a corporation. Um, things like insurance have gone up significantly um, in the municipal market. Um, we did have some revenue losses um, as it relates to some of our investments um, and, and, and some smaller pressures that we needed to deal with. But insurance and investment revenue were very significant for us as a corporation. So the combination of compensation, insurance, and, and investment revenue um, dealt with most of our available budget to reinvest in 2022 while still meeting those budget goals that we outlined of you know, staying below inflation and, and maintaining service. So that was our kind of framework. Um, and we certainly looked at it through a corporate lens. So when we were trying to address um, all of the budgets and all of the departments, we looked for opportunities if there were trending differences um, to, to take some savings in some areas and reinvest them in areas where potentially the trending warranted more additional costs to maintain the same level of service. And that is what we've done. And that is why you will see a few changes as we page through here as it relates to heritage. So with that kind of context, hopefully that, that makes sense to this committee uh, as to where we're starting from. Maybe I'll go through a few of these slides and just highlight uh, some of the changes. This first slide, just, just highlighting the revenue area in the Heritage Committee. Um, you will see the 2021 actuals and budget numbers um, there, and you'll see 2022, we're not proposing any revenue in the Heritage Committee. All the revenue in prior years was related to operating projects that were being incurred. And while we will absolutely have an operating project in 2022, we'll show you that um, in a few slides, we are showing that we are extracting all of our projects and showing them separately, just so as to not confuse the base operations of, of every um, line of business um, with these varying one-time numbers that are related to operating projects. So that's a corporate strategy. And um, we'll talk about um, the Main Street East Heritage District study, which will definitely be a project that continues into 2022 and will leverage some of the funding. Um, and that's called out in a few slides. But outside of those project-related fundings, there really is no dedicated revenue uh, for the Heritage Committee. So we're, rely we're relying solely on the levy. And that's what you're seeing in our 2022 budget with no revenue sources there, that basically the bottom line that you'll see in a few slides is our operating levy. So if yeah, you can page through, Bianca, thank you. So the next slide you'll see is our expenditure side. Um, so um, keep in mind those headers there. The last column is our 2022 budget. The first column is our 2021 actuals as of January 10th. So these aren't final. We still have some payroll and, and different items to get in there, but these are the best numbers we had for 2021. Um, as of the time of publishing this report. And then the middle column was our 2021 base budget. So you'll, you'll definitely see um, when we take out the impacts of those projects, which is the $300,000 that was in the professional fees line, um, you know, we are trending at about a $200,000 expense per year, 199,750 is our total expense there for 2022, um, which is a, a slightly higher investment than we made in 2021. Um, you can see that we are establishing a professional fees contracted services budget, um, which outside of projects was only set at $5,000 in prior years, and we're establishing it at $40,000 based on the priorities of the committee, appraisal review projects, and peer review work that staff has identified. Um, and that budget will obviously provide some flexibility to be reinvested um, as the committee sees fit. But um, the $5,000 threshold there was, it wasn't satisfactory based on our previous trends and, and the investments that are required. The rest of the budget line items you'll see are very, fairly consistent. Um, obviously the salaries change, but that's a direct representation of, of the compensation review and the salaries for those staff. Um, so I think those are the, the main areas I wanted to highlight as it relates to the expenditures. Of course, I'm happy to take any questions. Maybe the last piece I'll say on, on this is, um, the town of Grimsby also did a, a corporate allocation strategy um, that we approved with 
with um, our budget strategy in the fall. So we were previously allocating things like IT and, and maybe some insurance, and you'll notice that we no longer are doing that and we've restated the budget accordingly um, to make sure that you're comparing apples to apples and, and there's no um, misleading information there. So um, yeah, so then maybe the next slide, Bianca, and then we'll take some questions. So this is the project that will continue to carry forward into 2022, the Main Street East Heritage Conservation District study. It was started in 2021, originally at a budget of $175,000. Um, as of the time of preparing this report, staff were estimating that approximately $50,000 would be spent in 2021. So we're carrying forward the remaining 125 to see that project through to completion in 2022. And you can see that most of that project is funded through development charges, but there is a small levy component, which is funded from uh, levy corporate projects reserves. Um, so maybe I'll leave it at that uh, through you, Chair, and, and happy to address any questions or, or comments as required. Thanks, Melanie. Um, oh, yeah. Thank you, Chair Bothwell. Um, thank you, Melanie, for that presentation. Just to clarify on context there, um, the 2020 budget column where you have the revenue side, which is currently showing zero for 2022, um, if I'm understanding what you presented correctly, is it accurate to say that the revenue figures that were presented last year for budget and actual were one-offs, similarly to the 22 equivalent, which are one-offs and are therefore being presented elsewhere in the corporation? That's question I think, one. I think you've nailed that right on. We're trying to exclude the one-offs in 2022 from our base operations and we're presenting them separately. But in 2021, they were presented together, which is why you see those numbers. Okay, thank you. Uh, that answers that question. The um, next question I have is with regards to the Main Street East HCD study. Um, the 112.5 that is coming from development charges with respect to the uh, remaining 125, is that 112 revenue that's already come in or it's part of that one-off that we're not seeing on the top line in the revenues for 2022? Um, thank you through you, Chair. Um, it is revenue that comes from our development charge program. So it basically every five years we do a development charge study and this project was included in that development charge study that was refreshed um, earlier this year actually. We just we just refreshed it at the start of 2021, um, end of 2020. So this project was fully included in that study, which means that we um, collect development charges over the next five years, five years understanding that we plan to fund these projects. So we might not necessarily have all the cash at any given point, but the intent is that they're built into our fees and we will get that cash and it funds all of the projects that are approved in the study. So we keep a running total of those development charge accounts and make sure that they never go negative. But that is absolutely the intent is that this project would be funded from development charges that we're currently collecting and it's included in our current development charge study. Okay, thank you. Uh, last thing is just thank you for beefing up the professional fees because uh, long overdue. So that's all I had on the budget. Thank you. Thanks, Olivia. Any other questions from members of the committee? Uh, I just have a couple quick questions and I don't know if it's for Melanie or for staff. Um, plaques. The plaques, we have a number of outstanding Grimsby remembers ones. Um, I just wonder, Bianca, if those were already, I thought there was money set aside previously. They've all been made. And so there's no more, out, I just want to make sure there's no more money to have to go out for the ones that are currently just pending being finalized. If you could confirm that. And then if you could maybe talk about the 10K for the SNP, which is maybe, and I know grants is part of your verbal update, but um, the SNP being the region's incentives for heritage uh uh, uh, heritage grants outside of the downtown facade improvement grants and we're only putting 10k aside is there any possibility which is basically only one grant um, that the region would match do we have any option to put in uh, just because this is you know here um, it's it's so important that we show the value to the homeowners of uh, and recognizing the works and improvements they put in their homes and perhaps adding another one or two more 20,000 just to have additional um, opportunities for grants that the region can match if there's monies available at the, at the regional level as well. Could you help us understand that? 
Uh, through you, uh, the chair, I'll just add a few things in. Um, so we focused the money for plaques this year on the designation plaques uh, to get those moved along. Um, so the Grimsby Remembers plaques that were in storage have been installed. So I believe there was three that had like a draft. Um, I did send the edits in. I did I think they had like a database renewal. I'm not sure what it was. So they were looking for those drafts again. We may have to restart, but um, there is money that developers paid for their plaque that is in uh, reserves. So um, the price of plaques has gone up um, significantly since the last time I talked to them. Um, so we would potentially be looking at um, maybe like spreading out those three over um, the next few years, just because the focus was on the designation plaques this year, but I can get updated um, quotes and look into those details for those plaques. And then I also think there was potentially an opportunity with the 100th anniversary um, that they could look at doing um, the Grimsby Remembers plaques. I think they were going to do a special one for the anniversary, but um, if we have some of the topics we want to move along, we could maybe inc incorporate into that, but I will definitely check into that. Um, as for the second piece about the grant, so it's actually 15,000. So the, the um, town of Grimsby does 15 and then the uh, region meets that. So um, I was gonna provide an opportunity during the um, grant update, but if the committee would like to recommend to council that they consider um, having an additional, uh, have additional funding um, just for reference to the committee, uh, the program is set to expire in 2024. Um, so um, when talking with Council Both about the pre-meeting, we were uh, discussing potentially um, utilizing the program while it, while it was still in effect. So um, it's 15,000 and then they meet it typically every year. So we would be looking at potentially doing another 15,000 um, this year instead of just the one, but that would be a recommendation to council. Um, I would think via resolution. So I will pass it back to Councilor Bothwell. Thank you. Thanks. So I'm just trying to remember, Melanie, there was like only 10K put in our budget for, for SNP, and, but there was uh, 15K expended last year. And I know we expended every, every, all the money that we had. So that's just, it's just unusual to have 10 when, when our, when our grants are 15. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I guess I, I would provide that slight correction. We, we can go back and double check, but I'm fairly confident 10 is our base budget. We spent 15 in 2021 because we had some carryover and we, we leveraged that. But um, I believe 10 is our, our baseline going forward. Um, so to the extent that we would uh, go above that, we would definitely be seeing some variance on that line. We, we've only established a $10,000 baseline budget for uh, SNP grants at this time. That's just, uh, well, we can't even do it then because we have, the region expects us to match. <laughs> Yeah, well, and then again, there's always some flexibility there, but that that is what's in there. I, I it's the first time hearing of a of meeting the baseline to be set at 15. Um, so we, we can certainly talk through that um, if, if that's the expectation. Again, we have a little bit of flexibility here where we had an investment in professional fees. So if that needs to be 15, we could potentially look at our professional fees at 35 um, just to ensure you can at least deliver the one grant would be my suggestion. And, and we'll definitely take that away as staff before we finalize the final version of this budget. Um, as far as um, making it a, making two or three grants available to to, to the Heritage Committee. Um, I absolutely appreciate uh, your, your passion and investment there. And certainly if this, this committee resolves to council to, to include that, um, staff would be happy to take that direction. We are with our draft budget on a consolidated basis right now. We've spent every dollar we have available um, with the goals that we're trying to keep in mind. So if we want to invest an extra $20,000, we would be seeing that corporately as an incremental investment at this point. Um, I, I'm totally willing to take that direction from council should, should that come up in February, but I just wanted to make sure this committee was aware. Um, we, we've really done everything we can to make, make our corporate goals at this point with the draft budget we're putting together for council. So um, it would certainly be an incremental consideration that would go forward at that time. Thanks, um, Bianca. I know you mentioned that the plaques were, they're supposed to have been paid by developers and those money should have been tucked aside. So mm -hmm. there's only $2,700 showing in there, but to do these last ones that we have outstanding and you mentioned there it's in reserve. So we shouldn't have any further um, obligation in the budget to those is that can you just clarify that one more time please 
Um, sorry, I was just going to add. So for the grant program, they meet what we put in. So we've traditionally done 15. So I can look with Melanie to see where that um, in the past, maybe that was allocated. Maybe they were in different accounts. I'll have to look at her, look at that with her, but they'll still match it. So if we did 10, they'll still match 10. It's it's a matching grant. So okay. just want to clarify, we can still do it. Okay. Um, and then um, for the plaques. So when the developers paid for those plaques, they went into um, reserves just for those plaques. So they, the money can only be used on those plaques. But since that time, there's been inflation. Um, and we had a report similar to this, I want to say about maybe a year ago, maybe two years ago, and it showed some of that inflation um, for the Grinch Remembers plaque. So basically, we'd be using as much of the money as we can from the developers and then potentially topping it up. But we can see what we have for plaques. If that's not a priority for this year, we can look at it down the road. But um, it, it's inflated since then. It's been quite some time since we took those money, those money. Yeah. So. We didn't get a reserve report as to what, and I know at one point the question I had was, um, what is Heritage's reserves? Because they were kind of all lumped in with planning. Melanie, like we're, you know, there over the years since, you know, I've been doing this, I think it's it's really a gray area because we really don't know what Heritage has um, tucked away. It's kind of like just merged and morphed into the planning reserve. Is that correct? Um, so I guess the way I would address that is we did do a corporate reserve strategy and presented that to council uh, this past fall as well, and we rationalized many of our reserves. So there is no dedicated heritage reserve going forward. We have a corporate uh, projects reserve um, that addresses many of our studies and, and needs. Um, so they, it is being managed a bit more broadly to ensure that depending on the year, whatever the priority, if it's more a planning project or, or the years that it's more of a heritage project, we have a large enough base of funding to leverage that. Um, so, so that is how we are, we're moving forward with that. So to, to that end, um, that reserve is available when projects uh, come up that need that corporate funding. Um, and, and that's what's happening with the HGD. So that 12,500 is coming out of, of the corporate projects reserve to ensure that we can fully fund that. Okay, so I, I just would like to, to maybe just, you know, considering that we've probably contributed to the reserves and had some monies that haven't been expended over the last four to five years that have been sitting there. And I know Bianca's saying that the plaques are costing more, but I'm I'm, I'm going to, you know, suggest that since we're not budgeting for it, but I'm going to expect that they're going to be covered through reserves, the ones that we have on, on our, on, that are going back to 2014 that haven't been done yet, <laughs> right? Yes, so to the extent that there's commitments out there, we manage that every single year. Um, budgets are estimates, they're our best guess, we do them in advance to the extent that there's surpluses or deficits from known commitments and, and other items, we manage those. Um, and they would certainly be be addressed in how we roll up the whole corporation. We try to make sure that we're being strategic in that regard, that if one area has an overage and another area has a slight savings, they're offsetting each other before we, we go dip into our reserves as a whole, because we do want to ensure that we maintain as much of those reserves as possible. We do have um, overall as a corporation, um, you know, a bit of a, a, a funding gap on our reserves and, and our investments. So um, to the extent that there's puts and takes when we roll up an annual year, um, we definitely try to manage those in year before we go to reserves. But absolutely, any existing commitments would continue to be supported um, and, and we would report on them accordingly through our budget to actuals. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um... I just I don't know if any committee members want to root to look at that SNP grant that heritage grant 10 K I'm not you know if they want to put a motion forward it's up to committee members to put one forward. Um, I'm just putting it out there that it would be nice I think if we if we were able to offer at least one other SNP grant, um, you know, with matching to the region and while the program is still available we only have two years left to. To basically take advantage of that but i'll leave that if a member wants to move that otherwise we've, we've got 10k in there for for heritage grants so olia did you have your hand up no you're okay you, it's okay i don't know it might be it's something it's just a quick question for i think you had mentioned something in response to part of uh council boffle's question that there's a general pool of funds uh that's set aside annually for studies but it's kind of uh, in a general bucket and then whichever department needs it depending on the year I can't remember what you called that uh, doesn't matter the question is just roughly that I'm assuming that's a a standing uh, item that that uh, is reserved or is set aside for annually and if that's the case 
uh, what what roughly is that figure? Just so we have an idea of you know trickle down to heritage this year is twelve five. Like, are we talking half a million? Are we talking a million? Are we talking pennies here? Just to have a better appreciation of you know what slice of that pie our twelve five represents. Thank you. It's a it's a great question, Olia, and thank you for asking it. Um, you're going to be disappointed. It the corporate projects reserve. We contribute forty two thousand dollars annually as a corporation. It's incredibly underfunded. Um, we're we're trying to draw more attention to it, and quite frankly, in our corporate year and transfer report, we're going to re recommend putting stocking some of our surplus this year away in there because we recognize that it's it's not sufficient to meet our corporate needs. Um, so our annual contribution is about $42,000. And I think it's starting with a balance of about $140,000 or $150,000. So it, it's very, very modest. And we definitely need to continue to look to invest to it as a corporation, especially as we, we take on more strategic initiatives, more studies. Um, as a corporation, we're looking to um, um, you know, put in a lot more uh, um, guidelines and, and uh, terms of references and things like that. We, we will need to invest in that as a corporation. So it's fairly modest at this time. So 12,500 of our, our 42 annual investment for heritage is, is significant at this point. Thank you. Sorry, Pamela. Thank you, Councillor Bothwell. Um, if there's an opportunity for a grant, should we not take advantage of that opportunity? I'm, I'm wondering what is the process and what is the time frame? Bianca, did you say it expires in two years? Uh, through you, Council Bothwell. Um, so the program has been extended until 2024. They just did a reevaluation at the regional level. So it would be the regional contributions that would expire in uh, 2024. So if we have homeowners that have been designated, I, I think on behalf of them, we should look into this and pursue this grant. So, so I guess, Pamela, what the question is, if you want the budget to reflect, we, right now we have 10K set aside to offer a homeowner, like there's, there's a whole application process and a vetting that Bianca and staff go through, but this would provide an opportunity if we looked at asking council to increase the budget for one more because of the short time frame left that the region matches it, um, and we asked to go back to council for an additional 10K or 20K, I don't know. It would need to be a motion if you wanted to bring that forward. I just look at like Nixon Hall and the work that's required there. Um, there's likely other homeowners that have been designated that could likely uh, use this. So did you want to put a motion to, like the motion right now is resolved that the verbal update regarding budget we received or that and that uh, Heritage Grimsey recommends that um, um, recommends to council to consider increasing the um, the SNP line by an additional whatever, 10 or 20. Did you want to put a motion forward like that or is that what you're saying? Does this come from the region? No, we first have to have it in our budget. Oh, first. Got you. Got you. If we don't have it in our budget they, and, then, and then we do the whole process and then we then they'll match it if we award a grant right so we have to put it in the budget right now we can only offer one grant for 10k and the region would match 10k um i'm, I'm just going to put you on pause for a second there pamela um Olia, did you want to add to that just wondering if it can be written in a way that's flexible because staff is already alluding to the fact that this is a tighten your belt budget so if it was to come out of professional fees so that it would help beef up the plat um, the SNP, like it's not really um, spending any more money. It's just reallocating where it's spent. And then if we have the, you know, if we, we, we have it there as a possibility and we end up not using it, I, you know, it would suck to be penalized to not then have it in the professional fees, but given that this has a short time frame and it's expiring, it might not be a bad idea. I mean, it's not like we've been designating homes at a frenzy and I don't, as much as, you know, 35,000 extra on professional fees is very nice. Um, it's not going to speed things up much faster, but this will expire. So if it, if it moves from there to there, I don't think it's upsetting taxpayers because we're not proposing anything more than it's written here. 
but just maybe does it more prudently given its expiring nature. That's just an idea. Uh, Pamela, how do you feel about that, uh, looking at reallocating 10K from professional? Well, I don't think we should take away from professional considering we have the HCDs, uh, the beach study. So I don't That's think- That's a different bucket, Pamela. Yeah, oh, sorry, sorry. It, sorry. It, it wouldn't be taking from the HCD as, as I understand what Melanie has explained. It's just uh, taking it from a bucket that has never previously had that money before. My concern is if we designate these homeowners and whether we're doing it now or not, we've done it in the past. And I think there should be support for these homeowners that have been designated and us looking at obtaining as much support as we can. I think I agree with you. And I think we're saying the same thing. Yeah. Okay. So we're not going to go back and forth here. So what, what I think it's boiling down to, thank you, Olia. And thank you, Pamela. I think, um, uh, let, I'm just going to let Kate add to this, but I think what we're we're looking at is, do we look at asking the council for more money in the budget, or do we look at reallocating from professional fees, which is a 40k we never had before in there anyway, and just move 10k into the uh, into our our grants line? But um, Kate, did you want to add to that? Support what uh, Pamela and. Uh... Olia are, are, are suggesting um, to not necessarily um, add or add more money, but to allocate. Um, and I agree absolutely uh, with Pamela about, you know, um, um, that this is an expense. Like we've got a couple of homes right now that are in the pipe for designation on Ontario Street where some expenses like the rock fence would potentially have to be um, 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 improved upon that's an expense that potentially we could support the homeowner with opposed to them having to flip the bill and I believe you've mentioned something like that too Pamela um uh, the the great expense of something like that so I I support um as, but I also support writing into the the motion um just to flag that this is expiring in 24 just so that um the council understands that it's not us just wanting to add um add some money to support heritage, but it's it's to take advantage of some free money. Thanks, Kate. That um, So does somebody want to bring a motion forward to, um, again, like recommend to council that the, the grant budget be increased and based on that rationale that Kate just provided again, that the region's uh, incentive programs are ending in 24 and that it's a matching program and that we we recommend to council to, uh, or do we want to reallocate? So I need somebody to put a motion forward either way. If that's what you want to do. Pamela, do you have a preference one way or the other? I think we put it forward for, um, the homeowners and if it's not utilized then it can be allocated so but the question is pamela do we the motion has to go to council asking them to increase the budget so do you want to ask the council to increase the budget by ten thousand to take advantage of the of the snip the region's matching grant yes okay antonetta did you want to say something I did. Thank you through you, uh, Madam Chair. I'm just wondering if we can make it the wording like since the regional matching uh, program for heritage grants um, ends in 2024, that $10,000 from the professional fees be utilized for the heritage grant program should the professional fees be underutilized. So we're not asking council for more money. It's a redirection from professional fees to the heritage grant program to take advantage of the fact that the region is still offering this money. I just don't, I just wanted to hear back from now. Olia didn't suggest reallocating from professional fees and taking it out of there. Is that the will of Pamela and Kate? Kate is saying no, add to it, leave professional fees. What are you saying, Kate? I'm saying, um, I believe similar to what Olia said was that, um, it's there, so let's move it over. If we don't okay. use it, it's still in the pot. Okay, so take it from professional fees and just reallocate it so there's no new money being requested. I think that's what Antonetta said as well, isn't it? 
Yeah, I just am making sure I've got concurrence from all of you that you're good with asking for the reallocation of 10K from professional fees to the grants uh, because of the, um, uh, and, and really there's no new money being asked for. So I just see that Melanie is basically um, uh, um, a, a, a budget shuffle. I don't even see that is, is that requiring council's approval to do that? Or can we not do that as a committee because we're just internally moving allocations? Um, so through, through you, Chair Bothwell, I would say that to the extent that you want to give us that direction to, to do that reallocation, we could position it that way. Council will ultimately need to approve that budget when we present it in February. So to the extent that we want to present it with 20 on grants and 30 on professional fees, um, we can do that. So we can take that direction um, from this committee as our starting point. The only thing I would suggest is it's important for us to, to make sure that part of the reason we're establishing that professional fee budget is because we recognize that it is under uh, understated for the, for the reasons we need. So we want to make sure we still leave that healthy enough. But I, I think what you guys are discussing is definitely a reasonable starting point. Um, and I would just add to that point, again, these are budgets, right? So in year, halfway through the year, if we decide we need to adjust uh, within the budget that we have available that was approved, there's always flexibility to do that. So, so don't overthink that um, at this point in the game, we're establishing the funds available, but if we need to shift a little bit one way or the other mid-year, we, we, we can accommodate that. Okay, so I think what we're going to say then is uh, that the verbal update regarding budget be received uh, and that the budget be amended to move 10K from professional fees to grants to take advantage of the region's SNP pro. Help me on this one, Peter or Antonetta. For you, Chair, I had some suggested wording here. Uh, the motion would be that in preparation of the 2022 budget, the committee requests staff to reallocate $10,000 from professional services toward heritage grants in order to take advantage of the regional fund matching program. Okay, that sounds good. So, that's, um, so if that sounds good to everybody, I need a mover and a seconder. Pamela is a mover, do I have a seconder on that? Sarah, all in favor? Carrie, thank you. Thank you, Peter, much appreciated. Okay, so now we're gonna move to, sorry, that took a while. Thank you, Melanie, for your presentation, much appreciated. And staff on that. We're gonna move to the delegation, uh, 7A, the application te uh, applicant team for 133 Main East. And I don't know, who do we have representing the applicant today? Uh, uh, Councillor Bothwell, it should be a um, Kelly from um, SBA. Hello, yes, I'm here, Kelly Gilbride. Thank you. Hello, am I, am I good to go? You're good to go, go ahead, Kelly. I'm good to go, okay, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, Councillor Bothwell and committee members. I'm Kelly Gilbride, author of the Conservation Master Plan for the James Williston Grout Nellis House long-standing member of the Canadian Association of Heritage Professionals and senior heritage architect and partner at Stevens Burgess Architects. I would like to thank you for giving us the opportunity tonight to present our application for a heritage permit for 133 Main Street East. The application has two parts. The first part, the heritage alteration for a proposed adaptive reuse, redevelopment of the property inclusive of the adaptive reuse and restoration of the house. Sorry, and Kelly, are, are, you, are you meaning to advance your slides? Uh, it, just in one minute. Okay. Oh, Peter's doing it for me. I, I just didn't know we're looking at the, same, the main one main yes. screen right now. Yes. Uh, 
so the, the application has two parts, the heritage alteration for a proposed adaptive reuse and redevelopment of the property, inclusive of the adaptive reuse and restoration of the house. And secondly, the demolition permit for the demolition of the 1970s coach house on the property, which has no heritage value. I'm very pleased and honored to be here this evening in the role of the heritage architect and like yourselves, a heritage steward for this lovely property on Main Street. Next slide, please. The James Willison Grout Nellis Estate, I will simply refer to as the Nellis House, was built in the 1860s at what still remains a highly visible location at the northeast intersection of Main Street East and Nellis Road in Grimsby. The property is associated with the Nellis family, a prominent local family who were among the first settlers in the area, particularly James Willison Grout Nellis, who built the house. The house was sited with a large front yard a development pattern typical of the large farmhouses along Main Street. The house was designed and constructed with an emphasis on the Queen Anne style with architectural detailing inclusive of brick and stone masonry patterning, bay windows, steeply pitched roofs, and decorative woodwork inclusive of eave brackets, gingerbread barge, woods, uh, barge boards, dropped finials, and front and side porches. Next slide, please. Given both the size of the property and the house, it is assumed that over time, the costs and efforts, efforts associated with its upkeep and maintenance were substantial. And as indicated within the circa 2010 image, the site and landscaping had become overgrown and unkept. The original front porch had been removed and replaced with an inappropriate version complete with heavy brick piers. And the original side porch, though still intact, was showing signs of unpainted woodwork. Next slide, please. By March, 2017, the property inclusive of the site and house vacant since 2011 was in extremely poor condition, resulting in the town of Grimsby serving the former owner of the property with a property standards order. The roofs, as you can see, were clad in blue tarps and the windows had been boarded over with no ventil ventilation in place to allow the structure to breathe. A former rear one-story brick addition was in danger of collapse. And both the original side porch and even the contemporary front porch were structurally unstable and condemned. The house, though so designated under the Ontario Heritage Act in 2012, was in an immediate threat of being lost and demolition by neglect was firmly in effect. Next slide, please. Fortunately, during, during this process, the ownership of the property changed. And in December, 2017, in conjunction with the town and their heritage consultant, ERA Architects, the Burgess Heritage Group Inc. hired Leah Wallace, an experienced and well-respected heritage planner to coordinate the scope of work to stabilize and mothball the house in keeping with accepted heritage conservation practices. This work, referred to as the stabilization measures, was completed in 2018 as an initial step to provide temporary measures to safeguard the house until the redevelopment of the site occurred. Regular ongoing maintenance and monitoring has remained the norm for the past four years. Ensuring the vacant property has remained a challenge. From day one, the owner's intention has been to work with the community and an outreach program for women and children at risk to create a viable and socially responsible adaptive reuse of the house as a key element of the new development. Next slide, please. Over the years, additional well-respected and known heritage professionals were added to the extensive project team, inclusive of Mark Schultz, in the role of heritage structural engineer, and Wendy Shear in the role of heritage landscape architect. Stevens Burgess was brought into the project team in 2021 with the task to develop the conservation master plan for the site. The conservation master plan is based on the standards and guidelines for the conservation of historic places in Canada and uses the statement of significance, as the slide shows, the statement of significance and heritage attributes 
as the guiding principles for its recommendations. A key principle with the con within the Conservation Master Plan is that the standards and guidelines recognizes rehabilitation as the action or process of making possible a continuing or compatible contemporary use of a historic place while protecting its heritage value. Namely, the adaptive reuse of the site is in keeping with heritage principles. Next slide, please. The Conservation Master Plan establishes five overarching conservation guidelines related to site, exterior form, accessibility, health, safety, and security, and sustainability. One of those guidelines is site. Site is a key consideration for the redevelopment of the site, and accordingly, the guidelines for preservation clearly note, both new buildings and additions shall not be constructed to the south or west of the building, where they would reduce the view quarter of the house from the corner of Main Street East and Nellis Road. We have made one request. We are in support of all 18 conditions noted within uh, the, Her the staff's heritage report supporting our application. The one um, request that we've asked is a small uh, change to condition 17, basically saying that the new construction be designed and positioned on the lot to preserve the integrity of the home and maintain sight lines from the intersection of Nellis Road North and Main Street East to the greatest extent possible. So basically, this is just a clarification of point of view for the view quarter. Next slide, please. Within the conservation master plan, guidelines for the material conservation of the individual attributes is clearly established. And they include landscaping foundations, masonry walls, chimneys, roofs, gutters, rainwater leaders, windows, transoms, frames, the two leaf front door, front door, and the front and south porch. Um, uh, sorry, the front and side porch. Um, next slide, please. Some concluding thoughts. Um, the standards and guidelines recognize recognizes adaptive reuse as a viable option for the continued use of a heritage resource. A vacant structure, regardless of ongoing maintenance and monitoring, monitoring is always a heritage resource at risk. The proposed adaptive reuse of the property will provide for the means to restore the Nellis house and will give the house and the site a viable life going forward. A second concluding thought relates to the work completed by ERA architects in 2018. As they clearly noted at that time, the stabilization and mothballing measures are intended to apply to a relatively short term vacancy period of approximately two to three years maximum duration. We currently are in year four, and I would strongly request that the heritage permit be approved tonight with the proposed modification of condition 17 to include for the definition of the view corridor from the intersection of Main Street and Nellis Road. The remaining conditions we are in full agreement with. Thanks again for your time and I look forward to any questions or comments you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, Kelly. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll take comments or questions of the, dele of the delegation uh, only. Uh, if you have anything you want clarification on. Uh, Pamela. Thank you. I actually have a few questions. Um, is it my understanding then that the intention here has always been for preservation of this home? Um, I'd also like to speak to um, the community use, if that's Jillian's house. Um, I have a couple other questions. Um, I'd like to know about insurance. A lot of times when homes are empty, there's a challenge. Um, and if there's been any vandalism, and then I'd like to also 
maybe speak to some of the costs that have been put uh, towards this. And is this my understanding then this is the third developer um, to come in for this property? So, um, so far, those are my questions. If I could just um, maybe have some answers for those, please. Sure, um, I can, thank you very much for the question, Pamela. I will, or the questions, I will try to go through them as best as I can. Uh, some of them may need input from uh, Fernando to supplement what I'm saying. Uh, the intention of the development right from the beginning was to look at an adaptive reuse of the house. And that really involved uh, the restoration of the, the building envelope, the exterior of the house. Um, from day one, from, from day one, there was a commitment of looking at adaptive reuse and looking at a full restoration. And our conservation plan goes through, goes through that intention and stipulates what has to be done in terms of restoration of the Nellis house. Um, in terms of today, I'm not sure, to be honest, how many developers have been involved with the property to date. I am aware of two, the one prior to my client, um, who basically had left the house in a, what we would really call in a demol demolition by neglect state. Um, so I'm aware of those two. Since the house uh, was stabilized in 2018, I know there have been ongoing challenges in terms of monitoring and security measures for the house. It's done on a regular basis. However, we all know that a property that's vacant, especially a heritage property, they're always at risk. And there have been you know, instances of vandalism from what, I'm, what I understand. Um, in terms of insurance, I mean, you've hit the nail on the head. From what I understand, I think there's been sometimes up to 15 applications for insurance for this house. Insurance companies do not want to insure a vacant property. Um, so there have been clear challenges uh, with that aspect over the last four years. Now, I think you had a couple other questions and I'm sorry I didn't itemize them all when as you were speaking, but maybe I can, if you don't mind to reiterate them, I will try my best. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Um, so the other um, question was about the community. Um, is it my understanding that, was it Jillian's house that would be utilizing the home? Uh, yes, it is. I mean, from the beginning, I think there's been a commitment that it would be an outreach for children, uh, women and children at risk, and it is Jillian's house. I think there is also a desire to make uh, some of the spaces within the house um, accessible to the community for community uses. So I think it's kind of a, a sort of a two, two points, Jillian's house, as well as looking at the ability of using the house for, you know, whether it's community use of, you know, social groups, et cetera. Okay. And then I'd also like to maybe ask, um, I drive by this home every day or I walk by and I was actually quite happy to see this on our agenda tonight uh, because I look at this home and think we are about heritage and preservation of, and this home is extremely vulnerable right now of not being saved. Um, homes are not meant to sit empty. And I'm concerned about rodents, termites, the weather impacting it. Um, and, and I'd maybe like to kind of speak to the cost that goes into renovating a home of this size. Um, what, what is the developer looking at um, in terms of when you renovate a home of this size, um, can, can you speak to some of the costs maybe like, um, I have an idea, but I don't know if I'm really out of line with it, but I feel like, uh, when you renovate one of these homes and this home is a significant size, you're any, anywhere from a couple million to over 3 million. Am I out of line with that? 
like I'd like I'd like a big picture here as to what's kind of going in in terms of saving this home. And, and I think if we're the second or the develop the, the third developer coming in, I'd like to think that 10 years um, we start to look at uh, this home being um, preserved and some work getting done on it. So do we have any idea of cost um, to what that's going to be to preserve this home? Uh, Pamela, I think that's a very good uh, question. And I know I had some discussions with Fernando about costs associated with it, um, I think starting from even to date, I will I will say there has been, and I don't know what the dollars amount, but there's been significant expenditures over the last four years to stabilize the property, to do the mothballing measures, to also have, it, it's a little bit of a, not a running joke, but basically this project has a very comprehensive even project team we pretty much have two of everything so the joke has been we have the regular consultants and the special consultants basically meaning that the special consultants are all the heritage uh, professionals that are now involved so at this point we have a heritage planner we have a heritage structural engineer we have a heritage architect as well as we have a heritage landscape architect so if you look at even to date, those costs are extremely significant. Then when you add in the continuing monitoring of the house and repairs that have to be done. I know the first time I was there, there was a couple of gutters that, you know, really had come off the off the side of the house. And, you know, I reported back to my client and they had to be repaired. I know there's been instances of vandalism of you know, basically of uh, teenagers or others, maybe it isn't teenagers that have got into the house. So there have been all of those costs. When we look at the restoration of the house, um, I don't really have a number yet in my head of how much that's going to cost, but it's significant for this type of house. I mean, the, the fortunate thing, and really I think it goes to the original design of the house and the quality of the craftsmanship of this house, that it's really quite, it, it's luckily or amazingly in very good condition. You know, the exterior envelope, yes, it needs work, but all in all, when you look at it, it's gone through a period of where it seems to have had, you know, 2011, it became vacant or approximately around 2011. We're now 11 years down the road and the masonry is still in good shape. Yes, new roofs were put on in terms of stabilization, um, but you know a lot of the key features of, the, of that house are still intact. However, that doesn't protect really the resource because we all know these resources are always subject to vandalism or to you know waking up the next morning and someone has burnt it down. So this is a huge commitment. Um, also, as a heritage professional, my mandate has always been that I'm a steward of heritage buildings. So really my first, you know, really almost my first master is, is the house rather than my client. And my clients always know that. I sort of start from the beginning. But saying that, um, we really you know, it's really been a pleasure. And I'm quite, as I said earlier, I'm excited to be part of this project team because there is a commitment even to agree to my conservation master plan, which gave some real commitments of how they had to go ahead with work, which includes even qualified heritage masons, masons woodworkers, et cetera, which again, brings up the costs have been agreed to. So I look at it as we have or there is an opportunity to safeguard this house. But as you mentioned earlier, Pamela, I think it's definitely at risk. Um, and ERA also, you know, wrote that, you know, in 2018, where they said a stabilization measures are for two to three years, and we're now at year, we're at year four. Thank you, Kelly. Um, yes, I, I would like to see some restoration work. And it, is it my understanding the restoration work would be both inside and out? 
At this point, the commitment, the statement of heritage values only addresses the exterior of the house. So at this point, the conservation master plan is focused on the exterior. Um, we've had some internal uh, discussions about the inside. We've not got to that level yet, Pamela. Um, so I think, I mean, on my side, I'm, I will always be pushing for those, but at this point, the commitment is to the exterior envelope and getting a viable use an adaptive reuse of the site, which will enable the restoration of really this, this lovely jewel that you have on Main Street. It, it really is. And um, I have friends that drive through here from Toronto all the time and year after year, they message me what, asking why that home is still boarded up. So it would be nice to see this, um, this house um, be taken care of and um, return to what it was in its glory in that. So thank you very much, Kelly. Thank you. Um, I see that DeSantis Homes has their hand up. Um, is that Mr. DeSantis? I'm not sure who's uh, who the parties are, uh, if they wish to speak. Sure, my name is uh, Fernando Puga. I am the Land Development Manager for DeSantis Homes and I'll be speaking to the questions as put forward through the committee. Uh, through the chair. Um, so I want to thank Kelly. Uh, her answers were very accurate. It, it reflects our commitment to this project and to the commitment to the community. Um, with respect to costs, you know, I, I don't want to get into too much detail, but we've, we've had a budgetary item and we've, we've contemplated it because obviously it's a very intensive uh, project when it comes to restoration of this, this heritage asset. Um, you know, we're, we're between two and a half to $3 million on the hard costs. We're probably around, you know, three to $400,000 on the soft costs alone. Um, like, like, like Kelly suggested, <laughs> we, we have a, a very meeting, we have our regular team and our special team. Um, and we've made this heritage asset a focal of all our designs, of all our conversations. Um, and whenever one person on our regular team brings up a comment, we always bet it through our heritage to see what is the net effect on, on this resource. So. Um, we're dedicated to the continual preservation of this <clears throat> of this property and of this home. Um, with respect to vandalism, yes, we we have had vandalism. Unfortunately, uh, we do secure the site as best as possible. We have eyes on it as best as possible, uh, but it you know it doesn't provide the security level that uh, the new development uh, would have with respect to eyes on, on the asset, which is really the intent, uh, the only way to really ensure. Uh, the preservation uh, to its fullest to you know provide the safety that the community is looking for, um, and with respect to the insurance, yes, it's it's an ongoing challenge for this property as it is for many properties of heritage uh, value. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, we're actively seeking insurance all the time, and unfortunately, the regular response uh, from many insurers is that they're they're just not even willing to provide us a quote. Um, and it's in excess of 10 to 15 companies that regularly rejects any, even a proposal. So, uh, but we're, we're actively engaged and we're always looking for opportunities, uh, but it is a challenge that we have on the property, but, uh, you know, it, it's something that we're willing to accept as, as an investment, uh, again, in the asset itself and in the community. Thank you, Fernando. Uh, Councillor Dunstall. Uh, thank you, Chair Bothwell. Can everybody hear me okay? I just want to make sure my headphones are working. Yeah, uh, we can hear, yeah, we can hear you fine. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I just want to take a few minutes to shed some light on this situation because as a councillor and as a councillor on the previous council and being on the Heritage Committee on the previous council, this home has been or shall I call it a house right now, because it's not a home, has been a top of, topic of discussion uh, probably at a lot of heritage meetings, and I think Anne is shaking her head yes, from the previous heritage committee. Uh, and when the previous developer owned the house, it was quite clear that it was being demolished by neglect or, uh, you know, it was demolition by neglect. And it was the previous council that brought the, uh, the property standards order forward to get the developer to bring the house back up to where it was when he 
bought the house, which put a lot of pressure on him. That being said, it looked like I don't think he could afford to do it. So he has in turn flipped the house to our current developer who is in front of us. And uh, he has mothballed it. And it is now sat for another four years. And uh, the house was in relatively good shape when, when we examined it. Uh, the Heritage Committee had an opportunity to examine it. Uh, I think, Anne, you saw the uh, condition of the home. And I think it only was as in good condition because of, it was well vented. Now that it's mothballed, it isn't as well vented as it used to be. Uh, and it is starting to deteriorate again. Um, and as we hear from Pamela, her, her thoughts are that it's going to cost two to three million dollars to, to restore it. Uh, so somebody has to have some pretty deep pockets. What my concern is, and uh, Kelly brought, said the word, is risk. Uh, we, we, as that house sits empty, vacant, um, we, there's a high risk that something's going to happen. And the longer we sit and discuss this matter, the longer we wait for the developer to restore it, the higher the risk that somebody's going to vandalize it and it's going to be a cold night in winter and suddenly we find it on, it's going up in smoke. And at that point, I don't think it's going to be, uh, nobody's going to be able to restore it at that point. This is our golden opportunity to see this house look like what we saw with that architect's rendering just a few minutes ago. Uh, and to, to lose that opportunity after all these years would be a crime. Uh, I would break my heart. Uh, I should sure want to see it look like it used to when it was first built. It's a beautiful home. And it's, it's up to us to, uh, to support and move this project forward. So I hope the committee sees the opportunity. It was a great report that Kelly gave us tonight. And I thank her for doing that. But I think we need to seize the opportunity and move this project forward as quickly as we can. Uh, we can't wait another year because we've already seen, seen the tree. Uh, we've lost the tree, uh, the beech tree with, the, with that storm. So I, I don't want to see anything else happen to that property. It would just be a crime. So uh, I just wanted to shed some light on, on it that that house has been sitting far too long. And uh, we've got somebody who has, is willing to go ahead and restore it. And as I said, somebody who has to have some pretty deep pockets. It's, uh, so I hope we can support this project moving forward. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Councillor Dunstall. Uh, Mark? Yeah, I just, I'm wondering if I can get a clarification. I read in the, in the document from the heritage permit application um, on page four of 10, which is actually page 14 of 556 in our agenda. Um, the proposed work are as follows, demolish an existing modern brick, uh, brick coach house uh, constructed after 1970, which makes sense. I think I don't think anybody's arguing with that. But the second bullet in there is to construct a partial five-story condominium building confined to the rear and east of the property. Are we voting tonight on the heritage resource or are we voting for the heritage resource and the condominium building, because it does allude to the fact that <clears throat> the condominium proposal is subject to separate application and <clears throat> is currently under appeal. So if they're separate, should we separate them completely? Why, 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 are, they, why are they put together in this document? I, I, and it's just my ignorance. I'm, I'm new and I'm trying to understand if there's a reason for that, if, if anybody could help me understand. Uh, Bianca, I think, uh, yeah, if we can just clarify the, the delegation is on the conservation master plan and the applicant's uh, permit application. Can you just clarify? I think we're going to go into further detail further in the report, but if you want to just give a quick response to that. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bothwell. Um, so the reason that the uh, condo is included um, is because we're looking at impacts to the heritage resource. So for example, if it was a residential site and someone wanted to construct a garage, they would still need a heritage permit to construct the garage. So while most of the work, uh, it, uh, most of the detail within the report is regarding the restoration, the fact that a part of that building is technically on a designated site means that the committee has an opportunity to provide um, comment on that from a heritage impact assessment. 
So I think we'll have that opportunity to comment on that further on the report. Is that correct, Bianca, rather than at the delegation stage? Um, you're welcome to ask the delegation, sorry, through the chair, you're welcome to ask the de delegation any questions regarding the condo, um, but it is addressed within the um, um, proposed resolution. So this would be timely to ask any questions regarding the conservation master plan with respect to the actual development around it as well. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, yes, you okay. can. Yeah. So, so uh, committee members feel free to raise those as well. Mark, did you want to continue on that, on those questions? I, it just seems strange to me because the, the whole focus here that I, I read and it was well done and lots of great pictures. Um, it made sense to me that we were focused on the heritage aspect of this, just to see this condominium thing come flying in out of nowhere. It's just my read on this. Okay. Like I support the heritage part. I absolutely do not support the condominium side, but that's a whole separate issue. So uh, if, if we had to vote one way or another, it could be really Messenger scary. Audio. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Um, Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ulia? <clears throat> I'm not off. I've been off mute this whole time. Good thing I haven't said anything. Um, thank you uh, for the presentation. I'm sorry I missed part of it. Um, I hope none of these questions are repeats of what's previously been asked, but I will start. They're a little bit scattered, so I'll start with the first. Um, what, if any, is the relationship between Stephen Burgess Architects Limited, the preparers of the Heritage Conservation Plan and Burgess Heritage Group Inc., which is the corp that's holding the lands or, or however Mr. DeSantis has legally papered that property. So I see Burgess in both of those corporations. I'm curious to know what relationship, if any, there is between the two. Uh, hello, um, this is Kelly Gilbride. I can, I can answer that. It's simply, there's actually the same last name. There is no connection between Jane Burgess, who was basically the founding principal of Stevens Burgess Architects and the Burgess Heritage Group, where it's complete two different entities. Okay, I just, I didn't think it was that common of a last name, so I was surprised to see it, but thanks for clarifying that. Um, next question, um, I suppose this is for the DeSantis team, um, is when would restoration works commence? Um, you know, the mothballing, as indicated by Ms. Kelly, is already two, if not three years uh, past its viable recommended life. Um, I would hope that the restoration isn't contingent on what goes on with the condo. Um, so given the commitment that's been presented here, which looks to be substantial from a conservation point of view, I'd like to know when shovels would be going in the ground, so to speak, with regards to restoration. Um, I will jump in uh, with some comments and I, and Fernando may want to jump in um, after I do. I mean, I think this is a pretty difficult, uh, this is a pretty difficult one. And I know we've had a lot of uh, discussions even amongst our project team about that. I mean, I think this is a case where the adaptive reuse of the site inclusive of a new development is required um, in order to provide the means and the reasons for an adaptive reuse of the house. I mean, they basically are tied together. I mean, I think there's a full commitment to restore the house, but as I said, this is a case where just a simple restoration of the house as it is, is, is not viable. I mean, I guess in an ideal world, over the 10 years when it sat there, you know, someone would have come along and restored it back into a residence, which would have been, you know, would have been ideal. I think at this point in time, as I said earlier, it's really looking at an adaptive reuse of the, the site, um, which then helps to, um, you know, basically provide the means of the adaptive uh, reuse of the house. So what I'm hearing is that Mr. P Mr. DeSantis's commitment and pockets are only as deep as how favorable the outcome is on his condo development. Is that like one is hinging on the other? I'm hearing that they're they're correlated completely. That there won't be any work on the heritage restoration, which is apparently heavily committed to, un unless there's money that comes out of the condos. Is that right? 
I think when we when we deal with, I mean, any, I guess, any heritage property, there's always the problem is, you know, how do you give this pro or this building new life? Um, and as I said earlier, there's commitment and there's already commitment in place with Jillian's house of, of a commitment to the house itself. However, without doing something else with the remaining portion of the site, um, the restoration of the house is a pretty, would be a pretty stiff uh, measure, I would think, to be taken. Okay, um, that doesn't give any time frame on commencement, uh, which was my initial question, but I suppose I'm not going to get one this evening, so I'll move on. Um, I apologize if this was covered in the presentation, but I did see peppered throughout the archaeological reports that there was a stage three that was required that was indicated several times, but I didn't see any mention of uh, the outcome of a stage three archaeological assessment and the I understand that the staff deemed the application complete. So I'm just curious to know where I missed the mark on the outcome of stage three. Uh, this is Kelly Gilbride again. I think maybe Fernando can speak to that. I haven't been involved with the archeology span of the site. Sure, the uh, stage three was completed and stage four was done subsequent to, and it's both been filed with the MTCS. Um, should committee, this is a question to staff, should committee not have gotten some of that outcome or those reports in, in today's package then, if that's the case? Um, through the chair, uh, I believe the committee was updated that there was a full remediation on the site. Um, I'll have to go back and check, but um, those should those should be the full archeological assessments. So I can so there would, check. There would have been no write-ups on stage three and four? Um, I, th I believe that's full remedi remediation for the site, so there would be no further impacts. Okay, I guess I'm not understanding what you mean by full remediation. They remove everything from the site, so there's no lar longer artifacts on the site. And that would have been conducted as an outcome of stages three and four, is that? So stage three would have recommended full remediation, and then the actual full remediation is called stage four. And so that has taken place is what you're saying? Yes, yes. There's no more artifacts on the site. Okay. Yeah. And okay, that's, that's, so that answers that question. Thank you. Um, next question. I think it might be premature, but I will uh, just throw it out into the conversation to see if that can make its way in if, if, it, if the time comes appropriate later. Um, the report on the... Um, landscaping looked to be pretty preliminary in the sense that there was no really um, defined, you know, placement of things other than mentioning, of course, the apple pie and motherhood Carolinian replantings that we've been, uh, you know, using commonly in all of our discussions in council and committee and all other avenues. Uh, my question is, where would the placement of it be? Um, in light of the fact that if you're looking at the home, um, I guess, northwards uh, towards the lake. I'm not great with directions. Um, the condo wraps around behind the, the, the home as well. So I'm curious to know um, if there's been discussion around the vegetative screening um, flanking the home. It's, it's at some depth. I don't really know where, but at flanking the home on both the east and west side to mitigate the impacts of the condo that is proposed in behind it. So that when you're looking at the home from Main Street, um, you're, you're, you're having uh, your vision obscured of the condos behind it with the vegetative screening. I think that was a question for me, maybe? No, like whoever's yeah. covering the, the landscaping, I can touch on it briefly yeah, through you, Councillor Rothwell. Um, so that's one of the pr provisions we added was that the vegetative screening be used to mitigate any visual impacts and that it be integrated into that new modern layer. So those detailed pieces would really be sorted during the site plan and that the actual landscape architect, she's a very well-known uh, heritage professional that specializes in these types of landscapes. And she'd be looking at houses of this era and similar uh, greens that were used on the site. And we would like to bring those in as 
kind of interpretive tools to show what would have been on that site. And then there's efforts also where that vegetative screening is being used to incorporate that Carolinian. But that would be something that staff would also have um, some professional comments on based on placement within the site plan. And we would have a site plan um, uh, phase of the application. Okay, so that'll come later then. Yeah. Okay, um, next question is with regards to that section of the proposed condo that would be kind of behind the home, if you're looking at it from Main Street, do we have a number on the distance between the rear of the home and I think it's parking lot for a bit and then condo? Do we have an idea of what that distance is? Um, Kelly, I'm not sure if you wanted to answer that or Fernando. For um, you, the chair. Yeah. yeah, I think it's probably Fernando should um, should answer that one or or maybe John can answer it from RBI. No, that's fine. Through the chair. Um, so the approximate distance between the rear of the home and the front uh, elevation there, uh, the east west elevation is approximately uh, 23 meters. And then do we have, just for better appreciation of the context, do we have the lot, the lot depth, then the setback to the front of the house, and then that 23 meters between the back of the house and the beginning of those condos? Sorry, so are you asking for the distance from the heritage, the front of the heritage facade to the property line? Well, I'm just curious to know what the, so we've got the setback from the street as one kind of vista from a from a let's call it pedestrian view and then another vista might be from the back of the house to the beginning of the condo so just kind of trying to appreciate how this landscaping don't know where it's going to take root in a parking garage but that's a separate issue um, so some of those depths so that we can see and visualize the opportunity for this vegetative screening so the approximate distance, if I'm understanding correctly, from the front of the facade of the building, which is, I believe, the view vista we were discussing previously, um, off the top of my head, I and mean, with a measurement in front of me, I think it's approximately 18 meters. 18 and with, and with, Yeah, and, and with respect to the landscape plan, the landscape plan was submitted. It was reviewed by, or prepared by Adesso Design, but reviewed and vetted through our heritage landscape architect. Uh, through uh, the through Kelly's office. Sorry, uh, just to clarify, the eight, the eighteen is representing what distance the roughly between the property line and the front of the home. Okay, eighteen from sidewalk to front of the house. Let's call it no, Ru the roughly, line. right? No, pro property line, not sidewalk. I don't know what the, the road. Okay, is. yeah, fine, fine. Property line to the front of the house, and then twenty three from the back of the house to the well, uh, first yeah. elevation of the condos. And we're talking meters, not feet, now. Sorry, sorry, through the chair for clarity, though. I mean, the, the sidewalk is another two to three meters into the road allowance. So. Well, don't take credit for that if you don't own it, but fine. Well, you're putting me in a position where you're asking me to give you a number, and I'm giving you a number off the top of my head. So I'm trying to go out there. Yeah, the no, I'm, I'm visualizing the no, sidewalk in there, too. And I appreciate that. I'm just going to finish my sentence. So what I'm suggesting to, through the committee, though, is approximately 23 meters, let's call it, to the front, uh, to the pedestrian uh, uh, sidewalk and then a gap possibly 22, 23 meters from the rear of the home to the, uh, to the condo. Okay, that wraps up my questions. Thank you to everyone who answered. Uh, Antonia, did you want to add something? I do. Thank you through you, Madam Chair. A lot of the questions that are coming up from the committee are covered in Bianca's report. So I think it would be helpful if we can go through the report and instead of referring back and forth to some pieces that are in the report, I see some nodding heads on the committee that that might be helpful for everyone. Um, my suggestion. So what we can do is um, if we, I just am concerned Antonetta that um, the delegation, if we move on to the report from um, uh, from staff that um, we're not open to then speaking to the, the applicant or their delegation at that time because we'll be closing this um, and we won't have any further opportunity there. So I think um, if we can 
focus on some direct questions to the delegation, and then we're going to move quickly into closed, and then we're going to move to the report for further questions. So if you want to hold on to some of yours till we get to the further full report, um, uh, they can be answered there. But ones that are particularly need to be answered by the applicant um, with this, uh, with, with respect to the delegation, let's focus on those questions at this time. Um, sorry, Bianca, did you want to? I was just going to add the is able to speak to their application. So they will be there as well? During they can the still speak to their application, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. so we'll just receive the delegation and then they'll, there'll be an opportunity to ask further questions during the report status, during the report stage. So we don't have to ask all our questions now. Uh, Kate? You're muted. I just have one question that hasn't been asked so far to the delegation through you, Councillor Bothwell. Um, it was about pertaining to sight lines. And I, I just wanted to, to because Mrs. Gilbride, uh, Ms. Kel Kelly Grillbride, sorry, um, she said that this was very important. And so I'm wondering why we're looking at the sight lines from the intersection when if we like i understand i see the sight lines going this way and how we are not um the building is not impacting the heritage asset but if i were in my car or walking um and walking towards the downtown core um i would not see the heritage asset because we have not um reflected in this new build um the setbacks that are traditionally on main street east we've actually the the proposed building actually blocks the the sight line to the building until i'm actually directly upon the house beside it like i can't see it until i'm right on it so why are the i'm just curious of why going west driving west walking west are the sight lines important but driving towards the downtown core those sight lines don't seem as important where we would re respect the the um the traditional historic setbacks from the road just like the house and like many other houses in this area yeah. uh this is kelly gilbride i i can answer that kate um basically um, if we look at, there's a couple things. There was a, a proposed uh, cultural heritage landscape that I believe has not been adopted yet for Main Street. And basically the Nellis Road is basically the Eastern bookend of that cultural heritage landscape, which basically comes from the, I guess from the West going East. Now your point in terms of as we go Eastward, why are we not considering that view quarter? I think once you get east of the once you get east of the property, there have been significant alterations to Main Street. Um, even when you get to the property adjacent to us, where there's the uh, the nursery and the surface parking lot. So our view corridor, you're correct. It looks at the front elevation of the house, which is this historic elevation that would seen that was seen as well as that's the image that uh was shown in my first two slides as far as the the front elevation of this house um and then basically the uh the view quarter goes to that important intersection at nellis road and main street east Do you want to add to that, Kate? So I'm, I'm not, still not clear of who determines that. And, and it was when I'm heading west, not heading east, but heading west to the downtown. I'm not clear of why um, the, the west view is not important with the beautiful porch. And I mean, the building itself is the asset and we are not protecting that vista that's i'm not i'm still with your answer not clear of why that vista of the house is less important than the other way okay I'm, and i'm not sure why um the beginning or the end of a cultural heritage landscape would make 
one side or the other of, of a heritage house less or more important. I don't quite grasp your reasoning. I think when we look at it, I mean, I guess if you look at it, that, um, I guess what we did is we looked at prioritizing where the view quarters are. And we really did look as, as you get to the east of the house, Main Street has been severely impacted. Um, and we looked at it from that viewpoint. I mean, once you do get east of us or east of the house, uh, Main Street has been severely uh, altered over time. So it really became that the view corridor was less significant than the other two, uh, the other two views, one being the view straight on of the house and the other one being at the intersection. And you might want to look at it as like if you're again, we're driving west into more of a an area that has not been um, um, as affected as if we were driving west towards the hospital or east towards the hospital. So again, the new proposed build is actually obscuring the view heading west to an area that has been um, um, has 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 less uh, impact from from historic change. So again, I, I'm still not connecting those dots. So that's a concern I have that that the the vista, which is one of the things that we look at, um, to that the the view is not obscured to this. Um, and and it definitely by like by the 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 not reflecting the setbacks of that area that we we try to maintain by making the building larger going to the curb going to the sidewalk it does dramatically um you can't see a heritage uh, building heading west into a historic area more historic less less impacted area so it, it, again the dots don't connect for me but thanks kate um uh, brian Thanks uh, through you, Chair. Uh, these questions are either Kelly or for the representatives of uh, DeSantis Homes. Uh, I'm pleased to hear that uh, with regard, with the exception of the, the minor amendment to 17, that you're uh, generally accepting of the 18 recommendations for staff. Um, the question I have is in regards to some of those uh, deal with uh, language such as the greatest extent possible, uh, the original, uh, as close as possible. Um, and so the question is, how will you monitor to make sure you're making the best of efforts to comply with those? And will there be any updates provided to the committee should you not be able to uh, uh, comply with those recommendations? Um, this is Kelly Gilbride. I'm not sure if Fernando wants to comment, but I think how we how we look at any time we get um, basically constraints or in this case, you know, the conditions, I think the conditions are, as I've talked about in the conservation master plan, I mean, they really are guiding principles to proceed with. I mean, a lot of the recommendations within the staff report have been acknowledged in the conservation master plan. Sometimes the words are a little bit different, but a significant amount of those uh, recommendations we have uh, picked up. Uh, as I said, we've gone through the 18 and there was a lot of discussion even for me to be able to commit that we're committed to those 18 uh, conditions with the exception, as I said, the one of the view quarter clarification. Um, but hopefully I, I've been able to answer your question, Brian. I think, you know, we are committed to addressing those as well as many of them we've picked up in our conservation plan. And our conservation plan uh, really is the guiding, uh, the guiding principles when it comes to the heritage resource. Do you have any further questions, Brian? Um, maybe I see DeSantis Holmes has their hand up. If we can maybe hear from them and, and then I'll probably, if I have any questions uh, after they speak. Uh, through the chair. Um, yeah, Brian, with respect to uh, the conditions, we've deferred to our experts on it and 
we take a look at it and we, 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 call, we wholly accept the conditions, uh, same except that one clarity on, on condition number 17. Um, I guess the control mechanism, which you're, you're basically applying or suggesting, is, is done through the Urban Design Review Panel. And um, just for, for clarity, I, I don't know if you were on the Heritage Committee. We, we did the same type of thing when we went through Century Condos. Uh, although it wasn't designated property, we, we came back or we came to the Heritage Committee after we we exhausted and, and went through a very rigorous process of the Urban Design Charettes, which is the Urban Design Review Panel. And honestly, we, we enjoyed it. We believe that it fully engaged staff and then engaged the community. And then we came to we came to the Heritage Committee um, and explained the process on how we, we made the changes and tweaks and whether that's the windows or the roofing or you know facade changes that we made. Um, but you know there there is additional levels of security uh, with respect to better defining those terms and ensuring um, the proper and appropriate uh, level of compliance. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess it just. Maybe to clarify where I'm coming from with this one, it's we we put these or these recommendations. I say we loosely. The recommendations are put in, the conditions are put in, and we hear the commitment that you're going to do your best to comply with all those. And I guess it's just from a continuity standpoint, understanding as you move forward with this, are 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 you living up to that? Um, can we expect updates from you if there are any deviations? I think to get to the end of this and find out, oh, we tried, but we, we weren't able to get all of these and, and here's why. I'm just looking to make sure that we have some kind of follow up on this, so that we understand how you're making out with the ones. And I'm talking in particular the ones that say the greatest extent possible, because those leave a bit of ambiguity with it. But understanding that, you know, when you get into a project like this, there's things you can't forecast and, and efforts are made, but sometimes you can't follow through just looking to get some confirmation or commitment that will be updated as you move forward with this uh, and, and how you're making out with these conditions. Yeah, and, and through the chair, uh, we completely agree. And, and you know, it's constant dialogue uh, through staff to, to the Heritage Committee that, uh, and, and through the other levels, and whether that's through the site plan process, which is controlled through council, but yeah, it's it's a it's a constant dialogue. It's a constant commitment to be engaged uh, with staff and with uh, your elected officials. And I think thus far we we've consistently done that. Um, and you know, there's obviously agreements that have become a more formality from a legal standpoint to ensure compliance. And whether that's a site plan agreement or what have you, I'll, I'll defer to the proper professional on that. But. Uh, uh, you know, I don't want to speak for staff, but the, they're excellent at communicating with us, and I, I would suggest that, that is probably the best venue, but again, I'll, I'll defer to them. Okay. Thank you. That's all. And Janetta? Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair, uh, to Brian. Yes, Brian, I think to echo that point, we can build them into the planning agreements that come into place, whether it's site plan agreements or things of that nature, if it makes this committee feel better. Uh, just like we have Main Street East and Grimsby Beach as a standing item, we can add this to that project chart where you get your updates and update the committee frequently. I know when we've had any works, there were archaeological digs back in September that some earth that needed to be um, re-leveled for safety perspective, we emailed the committee. So we've sent countless emails uh, to the committee, just keeping them updated on a lot of the works that have happened here. So in terms of keeping up to date, it could be emails, it could be a standing item on the agenda, and it could go into that status sheet that staff prepares. The other side of it is that there we are proposing in the staff report to take financial security, sort of the, the, the stick part of this instead of the carrot part of this. Uh, and then there's agreements that are done on the planning side of things that hold the, the developer accountable to delivering some of these items. Hope that helps. It does, thank you. Sorry, Pamela. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to speak to, it was no surprise to me tonight that there's a condo development um, for many of us that have lived in this community for many years. We've known something's going to happen on this property. And, um, you know, I know many members of this community might be opposed to a condo, but there's many people in this community that aren't opposed to one. And they are um, anywhere from seniors that would like to retire in the same community, the part of the community they've lived in for years, which is 
relevant to a healthy lifestyle, by the way, for someone in their aging process. Um, not everyone wants to live down by the lake. There are those that want to be in the walking community. And there's also a hospital that's being built down the street. And it seems like a lot of times we want to cherry pick what we want, yet we're okay with a hospital and we're not okay with people having a place to live. Okay, I'm just going to suggest, Pamela, if we stick to the delegation um, and any questions with respect to the delegation or the report. Okay. Thank you, Council Bothwell. So um, is this not part of the planning for the Heritage Committee since we've seen another development that came forward before us previously? Um, Sorry? Maybe I could ask staff. Thank you. Uh, through you, um, Councillor Bothell. Sorry, could you just repeat that last part again, Pamela? Thanks, Lisa. Well, it's um, like we're being asked to discuss on the condo tonight, but is this not just part of the planning process? And with it being a heritage home, we happen to, uh, just like we did for Elm Street, that it comes before us. <laughs> I think we we get this here, uh, Bianca, like right now we're just at the delegation, receiving the delegation and comments on the conservation plan and the development with respect to that. But we can speak further to it, Pamela, during the report, if you want to go further into rationale on the condo, et cetera. Okay, I'm just asking for clarification. Thank you. Bianca, is this just the part of the process? Um, so uh, through you, Councillor Bothwell, um, because the app, the condo is being considered within the heritage permit, you can comment on aspects of the condo. Uh, ideally, they would be um, in relation to the impacts from a heritage perspective. Um, but you are fair to give your rationale. Just if it's parking related and things like that, we we ask those to stay to uh, the the statutory planning planning meetings. But um, happy to talk about it some more in my my report once we get to that point. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Pamela. So I just, uh, I see no further questions from committee on the delegation. I just have one quick one um, to Kelly uh, in the conservation master plan. Like this, the, um, this is the first that I've heard that um, the applicant is looking not to move the house. And um, the report just states that um, the decision was made to amend the official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment applications to keep the house in situ. Um, so my questions are like, has that gone to council? I don't recall seeing anything um, in an OPA or ZBA amendment to say that the applicant is not moving the house now. Um, the last I heard it was going to be moved. And then the conservation master plan based on that, the house not moving, just a quick question on the setback again. If the house isn't moving, um, originally it was going to be moved six point uh, uh, to within six point seven feet of Main Street. Now it's not. Um, so the setback from, as Olia asked, from the back of the house to the the actual condo development. Fernando mentioned twenty three meters, but the report actually. Um, mentions the proposed development was set back originally 16.75 meters from the house. So I just, I'm just questioning how with the house not being moved, how we now have a greater setback to the, to the condominium development. And maybe just to clarify that setback from the back of the house in the, in that report. If Fernando could answer that and, and, and whether or not it's come to council, because I don't recall seeing it, that the house isn't going to be moved come to council in an OPA or ZBA. Councillor Bothwell, while Fernando is looking that up, it's John Arians from IBI Group. Uh, we are the, the non-heritage planners on, on this particular file. And a formal um, revision was made to the application, both the zoning bylaw and the official plan. Uh, you may recall at the public meetings, there was concerns about the stability of the house and its potential for being moved. Uh, Mr. DeSantis listened to those comments. Uh, as a result of keeping the house, 
uh, the, the, the amount of underground parking was reduced and the density and intensity of the site was also slightly reduced. So keeping the house in place uh, ensured, you know, its preservation had a, a greater chance of success and also uh, ended up with a slight reduction in density as well. Uh, so I'll let Fernando comment on the actual setbacks because I think he has the site plan in front of him. Thank you. Thanks, John. I, I, I just don't recall seeing that amendment come through. So maybe it's you said a formal revision was made. I'll just I'll go back and I'll, I'll I'll look at that. Thank you, Fernando. Can you help on the setback? Yeah, sorry. I'm just pulling up my one track. So I just pulled up the drawing of the submission that was provided to the town in September, and I had error because I thought there was a row of parking off the top of my head along the rear of the heritage home. So there's not. So if I'm going to, I'm using a PDF, so I apologize. It's not 100% accurate. So I'm going to do some rough math here. 6, 12, uh, 18. It's probably closer actually to 18 off the back. Which was the setback of 16.75 when it was going to be moved, when the house was going to be moved, it was going to be 16.75. Uh, again, I, I don't have that information readily available, so I'm, I'm just kind of working off okay. the latest submission. Okay, that's fine. I just, uh, I guess there's still some question about how that will look with the site plan now being different. So thank you. Yeah, and just for clarity through, through, through the chair, the, the site plan has been formally submitted and it was formed, the revised site plan was formally submitted along with the uh, with the OHA uh, alteration and demolition permit. So it was it was submitted uh, to staff uh, via the revised zoning bylaw OPA amendment and also submitted shortly thereafter, or actually shortly before, no, shortly thereafter, um, to the uh, to the to uh, the town uh, via the OHA uh, permit applications. So was that then so what you're saying is those revisions were just sent what September <clears throat> October 1st or September 15th or something? September 15th, I, if I, again, it's, it looks like September 15th to the uh, town with respect to the OHA permit applications. And I don't know the exact date on when it went for the zoning bylaw. I believe it was a few days thereafter. Okay, so council hasn't seen it yet. Uh, I, through the chair, I, I can't speak to. Okay, okay. thank you. Antonetta? Yeah, thank you. Through you, Councillor Bothwell, the update of the revised proposal was presented to Council in closed session with our legal counsel and staff, uh, indicating that the building would indeed, the revised proposal called for the building to stay in situ. So Council has seen that and they are aware of that. Okay, so it's not public knowledge. It's not out there, um, actually. So this is the first time we're hearing it publicly. Submitted to council. So I this believe. is the first time we're hearing it publicly, though. Um, I think so. That's that's fine. Um, um, if there's no further questions from committee, I'm just going to receive the delegation. Uh, no further clarification required from anyone. Okay, so I have a motion resolved that the delegation from the applicant for 133 Main Street East be received. I need a mover and a seconder, please. I've got uh, Anne and Kate, thank you. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kelly and the applicant uh, and Fernando uh, and staff for the presentation and taking your time to answer all the questions. Much appreciated. We're gonna move now to uh, quickly, just gonna close session and I'm gonna just read, um, there's a motion to move into closed and Peter, if I don't do this right, let me know. Um, so resolve that committee meet in closed session under section 239 2E litigation or potential litigation, including matters before administrative tribunals affecting the municipality or local board specifically regarding 133 Main Street East. If I can have a mover and a seconder to move into closed. Uh, Olia and Pamela, thank you. And did you have... Um, uh, sorry, Antonetta. Sorry, you through you, Councillor Councilor Bothwell. I, I was recommending, as we did during our agenda meeting, that we talk about the report, the staff report, before we go into close, so that uh, the yep. committee can know what the staff is saying before we go into closed, and then and then speak to legal if necessary. 
So I think I'd, I think I put this on the agenda so we can go in and get some. Uh, I have a question for legal specifically on this prior to going to the report. So um, I'd like to if we can go into close briefly and then come out, uh, do the report. And if we have to go back in, um, I'll, I'll ask Tom perhaps to stay, but we might get it answered um, at this point. So I'm going to ask if we can uh, everyone in favor of moving to close briefly. You can put your hands up. It's carried. Thank you. And then I'm going to read a statement I have to read about electronic devices. Um, and Peter, do I read this now before we go into closed? Yes, thank you, Councilor Bothwell. That'll be done in the, uh, the open portion. Okay, so before we go into the close, uh, I'm going to have, before we begin the closed session, all members are reminded that any discussions in closed are to remain confidential as per procedural bylaw and our code of conduct for the town of Grimsby. Before we begin, I need each member that is attending electronically to confirm the following, that you understand that matters are to remain confidential and confirm no one else is present with you and confirm no one else can hear this closed session and confirm that you are not using any electronic devices other than your tablet or computer for the purpose of this video conferencing only and confirm that you are not recording this portion of the meeting. If you acknowledge all of the above, please reply with, I understand and confirm to all of the statements. And this is a recorded vote. Uh, I'll let you do that, Peter. I apologize, Councillor Bell. Oh, sorry, I'm just being the list in front of me. And we'll start with you, Councillor Bothwell. So I understand and confirm to all the statements. Anne? I understand and confirm to all the statements. Pamela? I understand and confirm to all the statements. Councillor Dunstall? I understand and confirm to all the statements. Sarah? I understand and confirm to all the statements. Mark? I understand and confirm to all the statements. Ryan? I understand and confirm to all the statements. Kate? I understand and confirm to all the statements. I'm just going to ask her to go upstairs. Olia? I understand and confirm to all the statements. And Mayor Drew? I understand and confirm to all of the statements. Thank you. And Councillor Bothwell, if you just give me a minute, I'll just have to make sure that. Um, Anyone that's not participating in closed session, I'll ask that you remain in the waiting room and I'll be placing you in the waiting room shortly.
anything uh, in case there are questions or? I think we're good. I think we're good, Tom. I think uh, I think you've answered everything we need for this evening. So have a good evening. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Uh, Chair Bothwell, I have my hand up. Uh, I just, yeah, sorry. I, I just thought since we're getting close to three hours and we're just about to go back into live, could we have a five minute break just to allow people to stretch? Certainly. Oh, look, <laughs> there goes Olia. She's at, she's at the baseball game. <laughs> Certainly. So Peter, um, can we do that before we go back to live? And through you, Councillor Bothwell, we actually are live now. So if you wanted to take a break, uh, this would be the time. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to welcome everybody back to the uh, Heritage Committee for January 11th. And we're just going to, as we're moving into three hours worth of almost time here on this meeting, we're going to take a, uh, we'll take a five minute break. So uh, 8.53, something like that, 8.55. That's too much. 8.53. We'll be back. Does that sound okay?
Let me know, Peter, when you're ready to go. We are live now, uh, Council Bothwell, whenever you're ready. Okay. So I'm going to just uh, welcome the public back to the uh, January 11th Heritage Committee, and we're back in open session. Uh, we have a motion in front of us now uh, resolved that the information provided by legal counsel in closed session in regards to 133 Main Street East be received. Uh, I just need a mover and a seconder for that, please. I've got Pamela and I've got Anne. Thank you. All in favor? It's carried. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to move to uh, report 9A, the Heritage Permit Recommendation Report uh, for 133 Main Street East, and this will be uh, Antonetta. Uh, thanks, Councillor Bothwell. It's actually going to be me. Okay. Um, so uh, Heritage applic Permit Application was deemed complete on November 17th, 2021. Uh, a Heritage Permit has a statutory timeline as, of 90 days, which elapses on February 15th, 2022. The Heritage Permit is being considered by the Heritage Grimsby and the committee's recommendations will be provided to council to inform their decision. This permit will be considered at the Committee of the Whole on January 17th, 2022 and will be and and will be put forward for ratification by council on February 7th, which will ensure that the statutory timelines are met. It is of importance to note that if no decision is made by council prior to the elapsing of the 90 days, as prescribed by the Ontario Heritage Act, the heritage permit will automatically be approved. In summary, staff have reviewed the heritage permit Submission for 133 Main Street East. The submitted proposal does not detract from the heritage attributes of the resource. The, propose, the proposal, oh, sorry, I just see that um, Peter just added it on the screen. So I just have the site plan here for your reference and then um, and, uh, a picture of the house in the current, uh, well, actually the pits have been filled, but basically the current state. Um, so staff have reviewed the heritage permit submission for 133. The submitted proposal does not detract from heritage attributes of the heritage resource. The proposal does not involve the removal or destruction of significant heritage fabric. And during this review, the application was found that all concern in regard to impacts on the designated resource were addressed within the heritage conservation plan provided within the um, recommendation report. <clears throat> Further to the Heritage Conservation Plan, staff are recommending the following. Uh, please do bear with me, there's 18. So staff recommend that the heritage permit application for the property at 133 Main Street East be approved, subject to the recommendations made by the applicant's co consultants, as well as the following recommendations. That the cultural heritage resource identified on the subject site be conserved and that the integrity of the structure be maintained that the committee recommend the demolition of the coach house and modern front porch as they have been deemed to be non-contributing heritage resources that do not merit protections under the Ontario Heritage Act. That assessments of the flat roofs be conducted and that the necessary permanent repairs slash replacements be made to prevent further deterioration to the heritage resource and that the deterioration deteriorated deteriorated modern front porch be removed to prevent further damage to the remaining original fabric. That the materials from the co coach house be salvaged and or offered to a salvage company to, to avoid ma materials um, going into the landfill. And should any of the materials be appropriate for the conservation of the heritage building at 133 Main Street East, that they be reused to the greatest extent possible that the new front porch be cons constructed as presented within the provided renderings and that efforts be made to ensure distinguishability between the original fabric and the new fabric of the replica porch on the front facade. That the exterior restoration of the house be completed in accordance with the Ontario Heritage Act as outlined within the restoration plans prepared by qualified heritage consultants and that the prescribed work be conducted by heritage by qualified heritage tradespeople. That access be provided to heritage professionals on staff to perform regular observation of all vibration and crack monitoring devices, as well as overall observation of the subject site. 
Staff will reference best practices and prof property standards during these observations. That the provided cross-section of the proposed foundation work un slash underpinning be updated to include a breakdown of materials and that it be presented within a detailed specification addressing mortar mixes and the expansion joints. That the original side porch, which has been dismantled and put in storage, be reinstalled to the greatest extent possible, and that as much of the viable original material be incorporated, with required replacements made in, with in-kind materials, and that efforts be made to ensure the original fabric is distinguishable from newer replacement fabric, and that any Ontario Building Code requirements be made in accordance with best practices that if any bricks are replaced during the restoration, it is recommended that salvage bricks from the modern coach house be used and that efforts be made to ensure that the strength of the replacement brick be as close to the original brick fabric as possible and that it be paired with a compatible soft mix mortar. That heritage commemoration be incorporated into the green space in front of the heritage resource and that the removed European birch beech tree and history of the structure be commemorated through these interpretive plaques. That the green space used, that the green space, sorry, that the green space be used for reintroducing interpretive plantings and native species that contribute to the streetscape, as well as replanting of a European, a European beech tree, as outlined by the heritage landscape architect. That vegetative screening be added to the subject site in areas where there is potential for visual impacts to the council identified cultural heritage landscape along the Main Street East corridor. And that vegetative screening be included, and the vegeta vegetated, sorry, that vegetative screening include trees from the Carolinian forest in an effort to maintain and enhance the Carolinian forest species found throughout the town of Grimsby. That securities be taken for the restoration of the heritage resource to ensure that the utmost care is taken during the proposed works on and around the heritage resource and for any potential damages caused to the resource during construction. That a tempor temporary protection plan be submitted during the site plan phase of the development application and that it be in accordance with best practices and completed to the satisfaction of the director of planning. That the new construction be designed and positioned on the lot to preserve the integrity of the home and maintain sight, land, sight, sight lines to the greatest extent possible. And that the new building will be constructed with compatible, distinguishable, and subordinate materials so the new structure can be recognized as a product of its own time and that the architectural details of the condominium building be minimized and simplified so that the intricate details of the heritage resource does not need to compete with the new modern layer and that the development be subject to an urban design review panel during the site plan phase of the application. With the robust heritage protections and strategies suggested by the conservation plan prepared by Stephen Burgess Architects, as well as the landscape plan suggested by Wendy Shear, and the additional pro provisions recommended by staff, this heritage resource is well positioned to continue to be a landmark on the Grimsby's Main Street East. The structure has been appropriately mothballed in order to limit deterioration. However, the longer the building remains vacant, the more likely further deterioration is to take place. Staff note, mothballing was only intended to be a short-term solution. Staff recommend that the restoration works be conducted before further inevitable deterioration occurs. Staff have thoroughly reviewed all materials pertaining to the heritage components of this application and are satisfied. With the above mentioned recommendations in place, the long-term retention of the heritage resource will be preserved and remain a prominent feature along the Main Street East corridor. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, if I can just get my screen back, that would be great. Bianca, if um, if we could just go back to full screen, that would be great. Sorry, it's Peter. Peter, would you be able to take that off the screen? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this is an opportunity for committee to comment on the uh, on the uh, attachments to the recommendation report uh, and ask staff any questions you might have. Uh, Brian. Do you chair? Um, does staff have a comment or? Um, 
I guess, can they clarify how they feel about the recommended revision to item number 17 that uh, Kelly put forward? Uh, thank you for your question, Brian. I think that's uh, a fair question, of course. Um, my intent with that original resolution was that um, taking into account all of the different um, components of the site, of course, um, currently the proposal is to have commercial on the main floor. So in order to have a viable commercial space, uh, they uh, optically would be best to have it closer to the street for walkability and things like that. So there's a lot of components that kind of go into the makeup of the site. Um, and my, the intent behind that resolution is that while we have all these all these different pieces that we're still ensuring that those views along Main Street are being maintained. So that was that was kind of my perspective behind my resolution. And um, I think if we were to look at revising the, re the recommendation, we might want to look at terms um, speaking to um, the urban design review panel that during that process, the efforts be made um, to ensure views to the house when you're coming along Main Street, kind of towards the downtown, the efforts are being maintained, are being um, are made to, I don't know if we could work through angling of the building or things like that, kind of have all the components work together, but we're still maintaining that view. Those are some of my comments. Um, I don't know if the committee would like to come up with a revised one, see what the applicant would think um, think of that, or if um, the committee wants to talk about considering that other resolution, but that's just some of my rationale behind the one I selected. Um, and then I'm sure Kelly can speak more to hers if uh, you have further questions. No, I mean, the, the, it gives good perspective there. I guess maybe I'll just ask, are you okay with that? Do, do, do you, and I recognize there's timelines to, to play into here and perhaps the going back and forth might, you know, prolong things unnecessarily, but, you know, general, are you okay with the language to put forward there or does it, does it need some further revisions before you'd be in a position to say, yeah, we're okay with that? If I could, could I just ask, Peter, would you mind popping that back up on the screen again, just so we could look at it together? Just to jog my memory, I just want to take some time to actually look at it and get some thought. Sorry, not that one, Peter. Um, Kelly's, she had the proposed resolution um, within her slide. I'm not sure, Kelly, if you know which slide that was. Sorry, Bianca, just give me a moment. Thank you. Oops, sorry, I was muted. I think it's slide seven, Peter. And Janetta. Thank you, through you, Madam Chair. Maybe while they're pulling that up, I'll just say, uh, you know, Brian, from my perspective and Bianca and I have talked about this at length, we generally agree with Kelly's comment. We also are uh, aware of the fact that if, you know, the town wants to see commercial along a main street like you typically do, then the building needs to be set a bit further forward on that side. So we're grateful that it has such expansive views. Uh, but to Bianca's earlier point, if there could be any fine tuning of that uh, done, we would appreciate it. Uh, certainly, we would work on that. Um, but generally, we have sort of these two conflicting pieces. We have a grand expanse viewpoint that comes from Maine and Nels, which gives you a very unobstructive and beautiful view to the house. But then if we, we typically want mixed use, we want, let's say commercial at the base, which is very common to add vibrancy to a community and services to the people around the area, that commercial for it to be successful needs to be closer to the street. So I think that's the fine balancing act with that. Um, thank you, um, Antonetta, for those comments. If I could just finish uh, Brian's question. Um, I think Antonetta put it perfectly. While we appreciate we have a very, you know, integral view here, we also have some views coming down Main Street and just seeing how those two pieces can work together, I think was a great way to explain it. We do identify, like we do identify that there is some views along the street. So with our intent of that provision is while we're doing those um, design charrettes that we're we're taking that into account. So um, that, that's all I would have to add to that.
Thank you, Bianca. Um, and Brian, are you good with that or do you have further questions? I'm good, thank you. Okay. Um, and any member of the committee is welcome to make a recommendation to amend the report or to amend an item on the report if they wish to bring one forward. So, um, Olia? Um, kind of a question, which hopefully might lead to an amendment. Um, I cannot remember which committee asked, committee member asked the question earlier on in the evening with regards to restorative works only being proposed for the exterior of the building. Given that this is intended to be um, reinvigorated through commercial use, um, the main building, how is it that we are not proposing restoration works on the interior of the home? I totally understand from a fiscal viability perspective that, you know, if they wanted to put you know, a meeting space of a certain size that a wall might need to be moved and they might have to put in an I-beam or something. But, you know, we've only seen the limited photos that we have in this agenda. And the first thing that comes to my mind from memory was those beautiful archways um, encasing the bay windows, if I recall correctly. And I'm just wondering, you know, it's not a private residence, so there will be public access to the building. So to me, there seems to be merit to putting effort into restoring uh, some elements of the interior. I can't speak to which because I haven't seen them. Um, but I'm just wondering, like, how that seems to not have gotten airtime anyways, it doesn't, it's not been included in any of this. Um, and if it can be. Bianca? Uh, thank you, Councillor Bothwell. The reason it hasn't been incorporated only is we have no jurisdiction to enforce that. So uh, through the Ontario Heritage Act, we only have control on the exterior. The, Her the Heritage Act does not protect interior. Um, but as far as we know, they are intending to keep as much of the original material um, as they can. But there's no jurisdiction. We can't enforce that in any way. Thank you for answering that question. Yeah. Anything else, Olia? You good? Okay, um, Kate. I just wanted to make one small point about language. Um, and I just was a point three on the recommendations. And it says that um, the committee recommend demolition of the coach house. I, I don't have it in front of me. I just have my quick notes. So I, um, the, the, I was wondering how flexible the language is that is here on this because I certainly don't feel comfortable recommending demolition, but I would agree to it. Um, through Council Bothwell, if I could just add, um, Kate, we can say that you'd be supportive of the demolition of the um, coach house and modern porch, something along those lines. Yes, absolutely. I, I don't feel comfortable saying I rec that we recommend it. Okay. Well, that the committee agrees with the demolition of the coach house. Okay. So Peter, your job is to capture all these wonderful thoughts and amendments and have them ready in something to bring up on the screen that we're gonna read at the end of all this discussion, okay? I will uh, take note and uh, emphasize the changes. Okay, thank you. So I think what we're looking with that change would be that the committee agrees with um, the demolition of the coach house, or would you prefer agrees with or supports? Uh, Kate, what's better? I think support is too strong a word. Okay, agrees with? Okay, let's put that in for now. Um, Sarah. Oh, sorry. I was just going to suggest maybe accepts. I don't know. That could be another alternative as well. A little bit more. Anyway, that was all. Sorry. Okay. So we're, we've got a couple options. Um, accepts is another one. Okay. Um, head shake for accepts. Getting a bunch of head shakes. So I think Peter, we're gonna use the word accepts. 
Any other comments or changes or uh, comments on the, the reports, all of the attachments to the report? Uh, Councillor Dunstall. Just another word, allows instead of accepts, allows it to happen. It's we're not accepting, we're just allowing it to happen. That demolition, is that a better word? Would you be more comfortable or is accept a good word? We're just gonna allow it to happen. Just Bianca, a Bianca I don't know, does allow I, give it- I was gonna suggest statement? permit, just cause it's a permit. <laughs> <laughs> all right Go, there's... i'm sorry i'm just joking <laughs> but yeah permit I think the, we're... the thesaurus us now whatever right? yeah. over, over possible optional uh, uh agrees to agrees we're to the demolition or we're back to endorse... are we a, a back to agrees agrees with which was i think antonetta's wording um so um that the, the committee permits the demolition or agrees with the demolition? If I could, Councillor Bothell, I just want to remind it, it should be in an advisory capacity to council. So you're not technically permitting the demolition, you're recommending to council that they permit the demolition, right? So I think, Peter, if there's wording that you can help with that, it has to come off with the role of this committee as their advisory commit capacity to council, they're recommending to allow, to permit the demolition, but yeah, it, you have to keep in mind your advisory nature to council. So you're not really permitting it because you're not the permittal mm -hmm. approval I, authority. And I'm getting more, I'm more aligning with the words that you had previously, which was supports. The demolition because it's what's within the conservation plan and within the app the permit heritage permit application we would we're supporting the demolition as it's presented so i i may leaning towards supports or agrees with brian are you thinking uh i don't know if i want to throw another one in the mix how about does not object to <laughs> I had to, you asked. <laughs> Sarah, you want to go back on this one? Okay, we're going to leave this one. We're going to move on. If there's no other, we'll leave it. And then we're going to come back to it when we get it, bringing it up on the screen. And we'll have our final um, hurrah on the wording um, when the recommendation comes forward for us to, to finally look at it one more time. In the meantime, is there any other sections of the recommendations or of the reports that anyone has any further questions on or, or needs clarification on? because we will be voting on the, uh, the recommendations that uh, Bianca read out. Sarah? Yeah, thank you, Councillor Bothwell. I think I'm just looking for a clarification on where we are landing on recommendation 17, number 17, regarding the, the language and the wording and what we're comfortable going forward. There seems to have been a lot of questions, so I just wanted to bring that up and get more clarification on that. So we need some fancy wording if people don't like the wording that's there or the wording that the that the consultant recommended to be put in. So I think Sarah it's it's if the committee wants the consultants uh, wording to be put into the recommendation then the committee has to ask that the motion be that the recommendation be amended to include that wording and if they're not happy with the consultants recommendation to change that wording, we leave it as is, or if you have alternate wording, then you also bring that forward as an amendment. Did you have some wording, uh, Sarah, that you that you feel you want to change there? I think I'd like to hear from other committee members. I see that they had their hands up. I have uh, maybe some ideas as well, but I'd like to hear from other members first. Yeah. Actually, I did. I wanted to comment on the whole thing. I just, I'm not specifically about the language. So if I, you can come back to me, Councillor Bothwell, please. Oh, sorry, don't let me forget, Ann. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'll go to Olia and then I'm going to come back to you. I uh, wanted a page reference because it was brought up on screen really quickly and I wanted to do a side-by-side -side for myself of the consultant's text compared to the 17 that we have from the staff report. So I just, 
either a page reference in the agenda, if I could, so I could see that again, because it was brought up uh, briefly a few minutes ago, but now it's back down. So I just, I would appreciate a page reference in our agenda so I can flip to it myself. Or do you want Peter just to bring up the, the, the motion as it would appear with both languages? So we have... Either way, like, I mean, right now I have in front of me uh, the clause 17 or recommendation 17 from the staff report. I just can't get my hands uh, fast enough on the uh, consultant's version of that text. So maybe Peter, bring up the full motion and let's do a, a, a as you type, we'll type in, type in the consultant's um, recommendation and, and we can actually go over the, let's go over the wording of that of the recommendation motion in, in big screen in front of us. I would just need uh, one minute, sorry. Yep. We always make it difficult for you. You, you know that we always make, <laughs> make it, keeps it interesting. We make you work hard at this meeting. Great, so um, Olia, you can see both languages. No, so um, yeah, so you can see what's added in bold there. Yeah, thanks. So what are what are your thoughts? I'm just have I lost Olia? No, I'm here, just thinking. Okay. All right. Give me a second, sorry. No, it's okay. I can only see a bunch of people at a time. So uh, Kate, you're you're and you're thinking, Kate. I am, um, I don't support this new language at all. I've spoken on it already. Um, I do not, I mean, I understand why the developer would like to, or the consultant would like to make these changes. I understand because the proposed building that they are proposing completely detracts from the view of the, 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 the side of the building that does not pertain to the, the Nell's Road North and Main Street East. And, and, and because they wanna go right to the sidewalk. But part of our, but part of our mandate is to protect the vistas, all of them. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I understand why the per consultant would not, would like to add this, because their design doesn't protect all the vistas, but that's our job to protect them. So I have um, a problem with that. Okay. So you want it to stay the way it is? Okay, Olia, did you have, have you got your thoughts on, on this now? Or? Yeah, having read both now, I agree with exactly what Kate's saying. I didn't realize that the consultant's um, sight line was only interested in the, the intersection. And, and as Kate mentions, I uh, am concerned okay. from all angles. Um, so yeah, not, not a change from this to that existing okay. as far as this clause is concerned. Okay. Thank you. Sarah. Uh, thank you. And I, I too agree with what Olia and Kate had to say. I think this, this particular, um, the, what the consultant's proposing here is where I have a hard time distinguishing the heritage application permit from the development, right? Is because to me, adding this in is clearly thinking of the development that's coming in the future. So I, I don't feel comfortable agreeing, putting forward this, this recommendation, the, the recommendation that the consultant is proposing. I don't know how the committee feels about 
Like, should we be more specific about the sight lines you want to protect? As in, like, should we say something about all angles? Or is would that possibly not be productive to do? I just, the, yeah, this, the consultant here yeah. is having the, the development in mind, I think, when she writes this. And I just, I don't know how I feel about that. Thank you. Uh, Kelly, did you want to speak to this? Uh, yeah. Oh, wait. Okay. Sorry. I'm unmuted. Uh, I would like to, I mean, I think what I'd like to say, if you look at the, uh, the new site plan that shows the existing house and shows the new development, the new development is basically when we've gone through it, I know we even had, they moved the development further to the East. I think we're being a little bit, it's not completely realistic that you're blocking the sight lines to the east side of the Nellis house. The reality is the house is set and then beside the house, there's the entrance to the underground parking, which really only comes up a couple feet off the ground. So there's been discussion about using, using salvage brick for that railing or that guard that would go around the underground entrance to the parking and then the new building is set. So yes, if you're at the adjacent nursery and you're going west um, and you see the adjacent parking lots, et cetera, at that point, yes, you do not see the house, but I think there's still a significant amount of space between the existing house and the development. So I don't really, I don't agree with it. You don't see the side of the Nellis house. You may not see the house, as I said, as I said earlier, as you're passing the, uh, the nursery beside this property, um, but you still maintain, you still can easily maintain a view of the side porch. Um, I mean, we didn't show, I guess, you know, I guess I didn't include the site plan with my presentation, but if you refer to the, the site plan that it's the end of uh, basically the staff report, they show it. And I think on there, on the site plan, you do realize you still will be able to see the side, the east side of the uh, Nellis estate. Okay, thank you for your comments, uh, Kate. Wanted to add some more, or are you you're good? Your hand's still up. Okay, you're, so uh, okay. Um, so what I'm hearing so far from committee members is they don't wish to see a change. Sarah did suggest whether we want to uh, enhance the wording to all uh, maintain all sight lines or something. Um, other than that, um, there hasn't been support to change the wording to the applicant's wording. So. Um, Kate, are you really putting your pencil around in your ear or did you really want to add to that still? Okay. You're, you're muted and your hand is up. Sorry, I'm humming and hawing. That's what I'm doing here. I'm humming and hawing even about the front, the first one, um, to maintain sight lines to the greatest extent possible. I agree with Sarah because even the first, the first, um, statement, to maintain the sight lines to the greatest extent possible. Who is going to determine what the greatest extent possible is? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, um, sorry, we've got a ginormous uh, five-story condominium in front of it. So that's the greatest extent possible. So I do feel that we do need to spell this out a little bit more because it does pertain to the new build that has not been approved yet. So I would like to, if we could. Okay, Antonetta, do you want to say something before I move to Brian? Uh, I think, you know, just to help the committee mo move on and, and make a decision, I, I think it's important to consider if we say every single sight line possible, uh, we want to leave it up to the professionals and the Urban Design Review Panel and the Heritage Professionals to come up with what are the sight lines that can reasonably be preserved to the greatest extent possible. We can say sight lines from every single angle, but there has to be some feasibility and, and realism uh, in that. And if we look at other applications, and I'll say even Mountain and Elm, only because it was recent, you're not having any sight lines to the back of those buildings anymore, right? So there has to be a level of 
reasonability to what <laughs> these uh, conditions are. Otherwise, they're just not going to materialize into anything. And that's that's why I think we we would like to see this go to the urban design review panel and let the professionals determine what, if anything, can be done to preserve that, acknowledging that we already have fairly significant sight lines to the building. Thank you. Um, Kate. I do feel uncomfortable, absolutely, not all sight lines, but this okay. is the, the it's a significant like the farmers had you know like the the people heading into the downtown core um at the turn of the century i just think it's a historic vista of all these people heading to the core um that we should protect and i i just don't see that we are so i think I, that's I why staff is seeing oh sorry go ahead, go uh, ahead i was just gonna say i think that's why we're seeing to the greatest extent possible that was Bianca's original recommendation. And then you said, who would that be up to? And I think, like I said, we're gonna rely on that professional urban design review panel, heritage consultants, landscape architects, et cetera, to help us determine what that should look like and what best uh, maintains visibility and the prominence of this historic home on Main Street. I just don't think that if we're looking for something like <laughs> a number or something like that, it's unreasonable and the committee could be spinning its wheels all night. That's why I think Bianca just tried to capture it with to the greatest extent possible. Who would determine what's possible? The answer is the heritage consultants, the urban design review panel, uh, just like how they helped us improve century condos and like we're gonna do for Mountain and Elm. So it'd be left to the professionals to determine that, but it would come back to the committee, of course, as an information point so that the committee is aware uh, what was able to be done. Okay, thank you. Brian? For you, Chair, uh, I was going to ask a question. I mean, there was some dialogue back and forth with some of the committee members, and I was going to pose a question back to staff, you know, in light of that conversation, what's their position on it? I think, Antonetta, you kind of recommended some language there. Is that the language that you just said that we go with on this one and modify it to kind of suit, meet that, uh, the recommendation about, um, I can't remember the terms you used, but uh, I think we're trying to address how the, uh, the proposal from the consultant on the revised language with either our language or um, a no. Um, I think I'd be more inclined to say, can we come to some agreement on this one? Because it's one of 18 recommendations. They've accepted the 17 of them. And we've got one here that we're, we've got some reservations on. Granted, it's, it's big, you know, the sight lines obviously are a big thing, but I think we, we established through the conversation here, the house is in you know, a state that uh, even if we're trying to preserve it, doing nothing with it is not going to preserve it. Was it was your wording, Antonetta, um, in consultation with the Urban Design Review Panel? I think the Urban Design Review Panel is a separate recommendation. Um, so it was the current wording is that to the greatest extent possible, what we could add is that, that the sight lines be considered by the Urban Design Review Panel as well. Um, but we do that anyway. So. I mean, it's up to the committee, but I think in the interest of time and everything else we have on the agenda, I, I'd like, that's why I think staff came up with the greatest extent possible and then that be left to the professionals, including the urban design review panel to determine what's feasible. Okay. Thank you. Um, um, Councillor Dunstall. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just wanted to add to something to what, uh, uh, Antonetta was suggesting, and that is that uh, uh, when this comes to council, we're going to look at it from a heritage perspe perspective, but we're also going to look at it from, from a commercial perspective too. And this is what the developer is offering with that section of his build is commercial, which has to be, the setback can't be as far back as what we would like it to be because it's commercial. And we need some commercial with the hospital build coming on board. And as a comparison to our other proposal uh, on the old Coles property, I was very disappointed that it was set back so far and there was uh, one commercial unit. And uh, it, it, Main Street East requires more commercial, uh, especially with the hospital build. So 
it, it, it's a bit of give and take. And I, I understand how everybody's feeling. We want to see as much of that health as possible. But there's, eh, you know, again, uh, Antoinette is, is her recommendation is let, let the urban design people give us the best of both worlds. And hopefully we have good sight lines uh, where we can see most of the house. But we, again, uh, we need that commercial too. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dunstall. Um, Olia. I will try to package up my thoughts because they're all over the place right now. Um, a couple of things. Um, the clauses 17 and 18, which are, I believe, the only two, if I'm someone, correct me if I'm wrong, that make reference to the new construction. Um, there's a few things that are hard to reconcile, um, which lead me to suggest the modifications I'm about to do. Uh, one of which is when Mr. DeSantis held his own open house that wasn't statutorily required, it was out of the goodness of his heart, um, at Nellis Public School in the gymnasium, there was a lot of public outcry about the height and density of the building with respect to not one referenced CHL by the consultant this evening, but all three. And what the reply, words out of his mouth, hand on, the, hand on the Bible, were that the fifth story was a requirement to justify moving the home. Now we're finding out today, publicly on record, that the home is not going to be moved we're also seeing that there's no change in proposed units, 148 today and 148. I can't remember, it was almost probably two years ago now. So I struggle to reconcile the authenticity of the claims and the commitment to all of this great restoration, which I agree in the consultant's report would bring it back to a viable state. That's one factor. I also 100% agree with Pamela's comments, with Councillor Donsell's comments that there has to be economic viability to this entire situation. But it feels like we're being dealt a very less than ideal deck of cards and whatever we decide won't matter anyways because council will vote as it does. So long-winded story to ask that either Clauses 17 and 18 be amended to say that any new construction, because I'll tell you right now, I'm not in favor of that density. Um, so if it were to change, but that any new construction be designed as it reads and continues, and that any new building, whatever that cookie crumbles to be, because I wouldn't want it to be misconstrued by anyone that if I were to vote in favor of this restoration, that I would be in, vote, in favor of voting for the construction that's being proposed as of today's date that could change in the future for more or less. I would go so far as to suggest that even that the new construction be designed and positioned on the lot with the same setback as the home. And I wouldn't want to bring in Mountain Street into this conversation or Main Street East because those are apples and oranges. One is a lot closer to downtown we also won't see the back of this house once this condo goes up, if it goes up as it is. So I don't know how much that brings to this conversation, but those are my thoughts that number one, we would either at least change the wording of 17 and 18 to say that any new construction, regardless of what form it take, be designed and whatever. And that 17 would be that the new building fronting Main Street would be set back equal to, uh, and which is similar to wording that we've used in previous recommendations and the property escapes me at the moment, but those are my thoughts. Okay, so Anne. I agree with everything that Olia just said. Um, here's my, I guess, to add to that, having been on this heritage committee such a long time with, you know, Councilor Dunsell was on with me years ago. Um, this house was the reason I joined the heritage committee. I watched it just crumble and I have to drive by it every day. So 
I honestly believe that this is going to be possibly our best chance to preserve this house. And I believe that the set, I am thrilled that it's not moving, to be honest, because that was terrifying to me. And if you'll remember, we are sat there worried about that tree. Was the tree going to survive the house moving so close to it? It was, we, we kind of, we weren't, we didn't believe it would. We weren't sure if it would or it wouldn't. Long story, the tree is gone. And I think that's going to be kind of, that's kind of symbolizes what could happen to this house. Like we are, we don't have a lot more time for this house. And I, if this, I'm not thrilled about this condominium at all. I don't like the, the setbacks on it. I don't like the view of it, but honestly, this idea, this, what we have in front of us right now will preserve this house. And I like, as a member of the heritage committee, I can't, I can't lose that. Right. So I, I we need to preserve this house and this will do it. That's just my thoughts. Sorry. And just to clarify, um, you, were you supportive of the change in the wording to any new construction in any new building that Olia uh, proposed? And were you saying that you also support the, with the same setback as the house for any new development or not? No, I totally would support that. So I guess what I guess I, I didn't get to the, my, what I was trying to say specifically was that I wish we could just separate the, the, the preservation of this house from all the other ideas about the condominium and the, what we require the, for the condominium. I'm not really honestly concerned about the setbacks. I'm not of the condominium at this point. I don't think that um, I'll, I'll support whatever language we can agree on as a group and, but whatever it takes to make sure that we can approve that this <laughs> Okay. The preservation of this house. So um, before, I'm, before I get to Kamala, Pamela, I'm just going to mention that we're not going to drag this out much longer. And I know we've gone, uh, it is a very, very emotional and sensitive issue in the town. It is one that does require our due diligence and the time that we're putting into it. And I appreciate the committee spending the time to do this. I'm not trying to drag out this recommendation, but I think what I'm hearing is the committee wants to get it right. So um, I just want to mention that any of these changes that um, we're batting back and forth now need to be brought forward as a, an amendment to the motion, so to the recommendation. So um, Olia has proposed some changes to wording. We had a change to the word uh, that the committee um, agrees with the demolition of the coach house. So um, if we can get a motion to make the um any amendments to the recommendation that uh that would help i know okay mr arians you're going to speak to this go ahead thank you uh chair bothwell and members of the committee um the, the the matter that's before you is primarily a heritage permit that deals with the restoration and adaptive reuse of this wonderful heritage resource there are other matters in debate as well, such as the height, the density, the setbacks, the commercial use on the ground floor, the number of parking spaces. These factors have all been referred to the Ontario Land Tribunal, and while they are interconnected, ultimately the Ontario Land Tribunal will make a decision on what is best to proceed with the, the condominium as everyone is referring to it. It's a three-story, four-story, and five-story stepped building. Uh, it strikes a balance between uh, the heritage components and the development components. As, as has been indicated, it's, it's at least a $2 million adventure to restore this house. That doesn't happen without the development going ahead. This being a corner property, there are four vistas in play. The vista from Nell's Avenue heading south, the vista from Nell's north, the vista from highway number eight west and highway number eight east. The wording that you're suggesting to maintain those setbacks and to maintain all vistas would significantly hamper the redevelopment to the point where I doubt very much we will have a project moving forward. So I would encourage the committee to maintain the flexibility, listen to your staff who are recommending the urban design and the heritage experts through the design charrette will determine the ultimate uh, streetscape and the ultimate setbacks. I think for this committee to weigh in on, on that important issue is not appropriate and I would encourage you not to do so. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Arians. Bianca? 
Thank you, Council Boffel. I just wanted to quickly remind the committee again what we um, and talked about a little bit uh, in the report was um, again mothballing is the inter the only interim option. So again, the continued vacancy of the building is deteriorating the structure. And further to that, just again, if this is appealed, we lose our control with the conditions. So just a reminder again that these conditions will ensure that the building is being properly preserved. I just wanted to give a little gentle reminder of that. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say, I do think we're getting caught up where we don't need to be. And I do think we should move forward with this. Um, our, our whole interest here is the preservation of this home. And I think to look at um, the developers showing an interest in doing so. And I don't think we need to get caught up when they're committing to two of the three sight lines, yet saying they're going to do the best of their ability either way. And then to go on to compatible building materials, um, we're overstepping, I think, and we've heard from our staff. So I'd like to see us move forward, please. Okay. Uh, Councillor Dunstall. Thank you, Madam Chair. Could I just call to question? Yeah, I just want to make Thank sure you. there's an amendment on the floor for the wording. I just, uh, if Peter can bring it up, and then we'll uh, we'll vote on. Uh, we have we have one amendment to um, paragraph three, which is that the committee uh, agrees with the demolition of the coach house. Um, agrees to the demolition. Of the, so. Um, The wording originally was recommend um, and, and Kate didn't like that. So we'll leave, we'll put, um, it's agrees to or supports. So, Olia. So I'm pretty clearly hearing that I wouldn't be getting support if I was to request for an amendment for the construction to be set back equal to the setback of the home. But in the spirit of collaboration i'm looking for support at least to suggest that if we change the verbiage to say that any new construction okay. in clause 17 and any new building in okay. 18 to okay. suggest that there is currently flexibility as to what that's going to look like as was mentioned uh, by staff in terms of the design charade and setbacks all of those other uh, things so i'm hoping that at least that support would be there so, uh, and so the wording text specifically if you need it would be um that any new construction be designed instead of that the new construction because to me, the new construction would be as we see it today in the draft proposal. So just for absolute clarity, we change it to state that any new construction. And for 18, that any new building. Yep. Got that captured in, in the, so Antonetta, sorry. It's fine. Thank you. For what it's worth, staff are, are amenable to that change and have no opposition. Okay, so we have three minor changes uh, to the recommendations in front of us. So this is um, this is what we'll vote on the amended um, motion as Councillor Dunstall has called the question. Um, so rather than me reading this whole thing again, um, Peter, can we um, scroll through? We'll scroll through it from the top slowly. And I'm uh, Kate. The question's been called, so we have no opportunity for additional discussion unless it's something you need clarification on. It was just clarification. Uh, had we decided uh, the the um, bugger, what was the point um, the, where it was? I think it was number seventeen where the consultant recommended us using um, another statement, and um, and we were discussing should we use Bianca's suggestion or the consultant's. Had we decided on that yet, or are we still working on it? No one came forward with an, uh, an amendment to this, the wording of this motion, um, and the consultant's recommendation was not supported. So, so we're not necessarily support. We're not going to support the consultant's suggestion. 
I didn't get that from any motion from anyone to amend it to include the consultant's wording. So the way it's worded is the way it's being left, which is at the, which is in combination with the urban design panel charade and whatever, as uh, Antonetta had mentioned that the sight lines would be reviewed into those processes. I would support that from Antonetta and Bianca. So that wording that they put in here was, was they assured that the, that would be considerations that would be taken into account moving forward. And, and Antonetta, am I correct on that? On the sight lines. I don't know if I've lost Antonetta or Bianca. I'm here. Sorry, I was nodding my head and putting our thumbs up. Oh, yes, we can. I, I, we oh, can sorry, just. I, I can't see you with the screen. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. All right. So, yeah. Okay. So this is the motion in front of us. So um, what I'm going to do is, uh, staff, we're going to go through it one more time, and if everyone can please read it, um, and then. We'll scroll through it, and then I'm going to take a get a mover and a seconder. Okay, so those are the 18 recommendations uh, with the three minor amendments made to it. I need a mover and a seconder for the recommendations, please. I've got Brian as a mover. Can I have a seconder? Uh, I see Sarah Nixon's hand. Thank you, Sarah. So what I'm gonna do is a recorded vote, Peter. If you don't mind. Thank you through you, Councillor, to the resolution as amended. Anne? And sorry, if you can just indicate uh, whether you are supporting, uh, and you can indicate yes or- Sorry, I apologize. I had my mute on uh, support, yes. Yes, thank you. Pamela? Yes. Councillor Dunstall? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Mark? Yes. Brian? Yes. Kate? Yes. Olia? Yes. Mayor Jordan? In favor. Thank you. That's carried. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, staff. Thank you, applicants and uh, Kelly for coming. Again, much appreciated. All right, um, it's late. Um, what we'll do is we'll do the verbal updates and then I think we're gonna talk about how much longer we wanna go on. So the first verbal, uh, verbal update, uh, Bianca, is Grimsby Beach. Um, thank you, Councillor Bothwell. Um, <clears throat> I'll try and go these go through these fairly quickly. Um, so my update on the Grimsby Beach is that we have the public meeting. I just wanted to remind the committee we have the public meeting taking place on the 27th. Um, that's another opportunity for the community to provide feedback on the proposed secondary plan and proposed zoning bylaw amendment. Um, and then just a little reminder to the committee, I did circulate before Christmas on December 13th. 
um, the urban design and heritage guidelines. Um, if anyone did have any comments on those, those are due on Friday, um, January 14th. Happy to extend that to Monday if you need the weekend. So just let me know. Um, I, I'll Let's just do that Monday. If I'll have them by Monday, that'd be great. I like that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't know if anyone has any question on questions on that. Any questions on the Grimsby Beach? I need a mover and a seconder to receive, receive the verbal update. And Pamela, all in favor? Carried. Thank you. Next verbal update, Main Street East. Thank you. Okay, so uh, for Main Street East, we kind of have a two-part uh, update here. So the first one is that um, we're still in the very early stages. Um, we've had some rejigging of uh, staffing resources. So I have um, now taken over the project management for the study. So uh, we're ready to um, really jump into it and get things going. Um, so we're really uh, in the early stages and our first step is to do some really robust community engagement. Um, that engagement is gonna start off with a survey um, and similar to Grimsby Beach, we'll be sending notification to all the people included within the study area um, and then We'll also be doing a, um, a mapping exercise where people will be able to go in and show where um, important areas are um, to them and areas of um, historical significance. Um, so those are two tools we'll be starting with. And then depending on what happens with some of the closures, we're hoping to put um, some um, signs up in a few different areas through town, like the library, town hall. Um, I think for other studies, we utilized a few other local businesses, just get the signs put up and then another opportunity for people to provide comments. We're ultimately looking for um, historical information at this time. Um, and then we also go are going to be putting together our stakeholders committee. Um, so we would like to have a member of the heritage committee set on that, that, um, that stakeholders committee. And then, um, I know with Grimsby Beach, we had considered a local, someone who really knew the area and also kind of had a good connection with the community. Um, so we were thinking along the similar lines, if someone within the Main Street East area was interested um, in joining the stakeholders committee, we would really appreciate that member. So um, I'll pass it to Councilor Bothwell. I believe you have a resolution for that. So we'll seek some interest from committee members. There's actually two committees being formed. One is the stakeholder one that's happening now, and there'll be a technical advisory committee that'll be formed. Uh, should an HCD plan be recommended, I believe, right, uh, Bianca? Yeah, so I believe what we'll do is similar to Grimsby Beach. So technical typically has like um, different agencies included in it. And then um, for Grimsby Beach, I was the heritage representative for that uh, from a technical standpoint. And so we'd probably do something similar, but we'd continue the stakeholders group. So we would have both. And there's also um, the stakeholders group also um, does have residents who currently live on Main Street East who can choose to be members of that as well or put their name forward, right? Yeah, so uh, what our hope is to have, um, we have already had uh, Wayne reach out from the Historical Society, so we'll be having him join the committee. And then um, I've also reached out to Save Main Street to see if they'd be interested. And then um, we have had quite a few residents show interest, so we're working on getting those members. And then ideally, we'd like to have um, someone that has maybe a clinic use to help give us perspective on that. And then um, I'm meeting with the DIA tomorrow to hopefully have a representative from the DIA um, and then uh, potentially someone from Grimsby Green as well. So we're just trying to cover all the different aspects. So, okay, thank yeah. you. So, yeah. So what I'll do now is I'll reach out to committee members to ask if there's interest on being the representative on the Main Street East study uh, project stakeholder committee. Um, so I see Pamela. Thank you. Um, I would be interested. Okay, Olia. Um, just a quick question to clarify. Bianca said someone was a clinic use. What did you mean by that? Uh, through you, Councillor Bothwell, we were hoping to have someone on the stakeholders committee that had um, one of the like. There's a lot of converted dwellings that have a clinic use inside of it, so we're hoping to have someone that has a business like that in the study area to have that perspective okay. because of the hospital. Understood. Yeah. Okay. Well, I would, I would throw my hat into the ring regardless of that question. For the heritage committee? 
Yeah, for being introduced. Yes. Introduced. Okay. So we have two. We have two members of committee who have shown interest in being um, on that. Uh, Bianca, is there an opportunity for two, or do we only have to pick one? Um, I I think we could manage with two if that if there's interest. Um, so are both of you willing to stand for uh, representatives on that committee? Pamela, you, you good with that? Olia, you good with that? Okay, so we'll have both of you um, put forward. Uh, Bianca, please. So my motion's going to read both, okay? Perfect, thank you. So I have a motion um, uh, resolved that the verbal update regarding Main Street be received and that Olia and Pamela be appointed as the Heritage uh, Conservation District Study Stakeholder Group representatives for the Heritage Grimsby Advisory Committee. And I need a mover and a seconder. I've got Anne and I've got Kate, all in favor. That's carried, thank you. Nixon Hall. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bothwell. This will be relatively brief. Um, so I just heard that this, well, they were they arrived before Christmas, but the cedar shakes have arrived um, on the property at Nixon Hall. So this is just a reminder again that they're doing maintenance of the roof, replacing shingles with uh, cedar shake shingles with cedar shake shingles. So it's just considered maintenance. So no heritage permit is required. Um, and I just, again, wanted to encourage members of the community if there is homeowners who inquire about what's going on. Um, just in, I just invite you to share that information with them and the good news. And then the other piece was that staff have been invited on site to provide inspection during the proposed works to make sure um, it's being uh, conducted in accordance with best practice. So that's just the update for that one. Thank you. Any questions for Bianca? Seeing none, I need a mover and a seconder to resolve that the verbal update regarding Nixon Hall be received. Pamela, uh, Olia, all in favor? Carried. Next one, uh, Carnegie Library. Um, thank you through um, Councillor Bothwell. Um, so I have spoken with um, the Parks and Recreation Department. Um, it sounds like there's been um, some leaks with the inside the Carnegie building and that was uh, affected by the uh, slate roof. So um, the roof currently contains a significant amount of the original shingles. However, deterioration of the, the um, heritage fabric is uh, occurring. So at some point metal flashing was added to the heritage building um, and ideally it would be replaced with something that's stainless um, because currently it's rusting, which is causing, causing further deterioration to the slate. So our expectation is that the heritage fabric will be preserved to the greatest extent possible with replacement slate being sympathetic to both the appearance and the overall heritage fabric of the original. Um, and that um, just an update that this is considered maintenance and that no heritage permits will be required. So it's just a little update there and we will keep you in the loop on that one. So just to clarify, is it the, the slate shingles that are that there's issues with or only the flashing that's going to be replaced so it's kind of both um so there's parts where um the fabric is deteriorating at a faster rate um so they're experiencing a lot of um um leaking from that and then further to that the fact that those metal flashings aren't stainless they're um they're giving off residue of rust. So they're further deteriorating even more. Um, so ideally we would replace all of the flashing with something that's stainless to prevent that from happening, continuing to happen. And then uh, we would assess the deteriorated um, slate. And then um, ideally we would like to replace in kind with um, uh, sympathetic materials that will work with the existing. And then um, in the case that there's a lot more deterioration than we expected and there's not a lot of viable, then we would probably look at getting um, quotes for something that's um, maybe a synthetic material, but that looks really close to a, a slate. Um, but I think that's something that we would have to look at down the road. So. Okay, so that might come back. If yeah, not. right now it's considered maintenance if if it's all replaced in kind. So we're just it's more of a just letting you know when you see work happening that's what's happening. Um, but I think if we have a significant amount of deterioration, then if we decide to just go with slate, then we don't need to come back. That's just maintenance. If it's a significant change, then we can consider coming back and 
um, talking to the committee about it. Yeah, I think that would be good just yeah. just to, to as, if it is like replacing the whole roof or something. So thank you, Bianca. Yeah, and, yeah, we don't know how much of the structure has been compromised as well. So I think maybe we'll make this a standing item depending on um, how things go. I know right now Mike from Parks and Recreation has a heritage professional on site and they're working on getting some drone footage um, so we can take a closer look. So we're definitely on it. We just wanted to give everyone a heads up. So nobody's going to climb up on the roof and look in the middle of winter when it's no <laughs> we're <laughs> utilizing the drone yes thank okay. you um so i have a motion resolved that the verbal update regarding carnegie library be received can i have a mover and a seconder please uh, i've got Oli and pamela pamela all in favor it's carried thank you and designation flax uh thank you councillor bothwell um so in speaking with the heritage homeowners, um, there was a preference for picking up the plaques at a later date. They were not quite ready yet for a public event. I think this has to do with the new strand of the variant. Um, staff is very much looking forward to giving out the beautiful plaques in person in a safe and um, meaningful manner. However, we didn't receive a positive response at the time. So um, what we'd like to do is showcase these plaques through our social media platforms. And then as a surprise to, it was supposed to be a surprise for both the committee and um, the heritage homeowners, we had these beautiful water, um, watercolor paintings done uh, by a local artists for each of the properties. And we were hoping um, to share them with everybody that night, but unfortunately it didn't happen. So we wanna showcase both the plaque and the watercolored paintings on our social media. Um, and really show all the hard work in both the plaques as well as the paintings. Um, so I've spoke with the homeowners and um, they want to arrange the pickups. Um, currently it's not um, epoxy season, so they won't be able to install them just yet, but um, with the warmer months coming, hopefully we can go get on site and take some pictures when they're installed. But with uh, right now we'll be able to give them their paintings, the plaque, and then we have a really thorough instruction on how to apply these plaques and we'll be available to answer any of their questions. So that's just the update on the plaques and I'll pass it back to you, Councillor Bothwell. So that's just something I was thinking about with it being the 100th anniversary of the town and heritage being such a key feature. And we're going to talk about that a little at the end of the meeting if we have time. But um, I think it's great to uh, the heritage committee looking at ways to promote heritage during this uh, 100th year anniversary. And this is a great way to do it through social media. How do you how do you feel the rollout of those? Because um, we have quite a number of plaques that we're going to be awarded. So how do you see that rollout happening on social media? Uh, we could do one a month and feature the building we could do we could talk about frequency i don't i don't know if every two weeks they would committee would like it i think we should highlight each one individually and give it maybe we can have like a little something about the history of the house since we have all the designations we could do maybe the statement of significance i can pare that down and put something up there about the history and then we can showcase it maybe a picture of the house the plaque and uh uh the painting well the painting is the house so or the building so I think that's exciting. So I hope yeah. we can maybe we can firm those details up. We can't go any later in February. So I think we really need to look at that as uh, whether we create a working group or whether we just provide direction and get that moving, because I think uh, it'd be great to get started on that and have some decision on how we want to move that forward. Right. Yeah, sure. If the committee would like to be involved in how the implementation of the posts are, um, I can also we can also talk um through email or we're happy to do the postings as well and we can do it as I mentioned we can I can have a blurb at the top and then have the plaque and the painting if the committee is okay with that and we could roll it out either uh, every two weeks or we could do it on a month if we want to extend how long and just have a presence on the social media I think that would be nice how about maybe you just send us all something after the meeting just to give us a little more of your ideas okay just to just to think about and I can send you guys the paintings I That'd think be you'll awesome. be all very okay. impressed <laughs> Looking very forward beautiful. To that. so do we have any um, any questions on Bianca's uh, report on the designation plaques and it's unfortunate that we weren't able to have that that wonderful December event and I know that there was work put into it and uh, it's just not the right time COVID's been pretty nasty to everybody um can I have a mover and a seconder to receive uh the designation that the update regarding the designation plaques be received Mayor Jordan and Pamela again, thank you. All in favor? It's carried. Thank you. And the next one is the grants. 
Uh, three, thank you, Council Bothwell. So we covered the, the main piece of my update, which was uh, discussing potentially adding another, uh, potentially adding funding for another grant. So we covered that. So I'll just add that we did receive um, confirmation from the region that they will meet our Nixon Hall, Nixon Hall grant. So we now have everything in place that the conservation work can uh, commence. So um, that's just some exciting news to share with everyone. So thank you. So resolve verbal update regarding grants to be received, mover and seconder, Olia, Brian, all in favor? Carried. Uh, budget, I think we touched that too, but you wanna? I think we just moved that one up. We got that one. We got that one covered. Yeah. We, we covered it through Melanie, right? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. And the resolution that. went. Yep. So that's done. And we did the report for Main Street. Um, so we have a couple of items left on our agenda. If the committee is okay with it, we're going to keep going um, and see if we can. Olia, did you want to say something? Sorry, just I'm going to be really quick. Um, I didn't realize we'd lost all opportunity to talk on budget. Just really quickly, um, the 35 or 40 grand, whatever it was, that was earmarked for consultant fees, which was a, an increase to the budget from what we've historically had. Is all of that kind of spoken for in staff's mind in terms of peer reviews and things like that? Or is there anything uh, contemplated for using some of that budget money for uh, getting designation reports uh, farmed out, just given the workload that is on you guys right now with all the applications in play. Uh, thank you, um, Olia, through you, Councillor Bothwell. So that that money's, uh, the money in that, um, in that designated area is for, you know, peer reviews and things like that, that we may need on our designation reports um, and things like that. And so, it's accounted for in that sense. We do have a few designation reports that we've been slowly working on uh, with the um, coming of students and things like that. So um, my concern with the designation reports, um, so I, I would say we have about three that are about probably 90%, um, but we're in a different situation now with Bill 108. So um, because there's two opportunities now for appeal, um, Oli, I'm not sure if you were caught up on Bill 108, so I can quickly go over it just because you haven't been around um, at the meeting. So through the Bill 108, before it used to be that when you um, did that notice of intention to designate, you they had an opportunity to appeal. But now what they've done is they've kept that, but they've added now you have to pass a designation bylaw and then they can appeal again. So um, kind of some of the concerns with that is if it goes straight to the Ontario Land Tribunal, it's um, legal and binding. So they can remove things from the attribute list. They can remove things from the statement of significance. They can water down some of those protections. So what we would like to do ideally is have the homeowners on board prior to moving forward with dem demolitions, oh, sorry, demolitions, designations, um, to ensure that we don't have those hostile designation situations. So I think we have three really good con contenders right now. And I think we would like to spend some time with the homeowners now and see what they think about that. So I, I think it's just a different situation and we won't be able to move them along as quickly as we had uh, prior to Bill 108. So those are just some thoughts on the designation. I don't know if Antonetta wants to add. If I could, through you, Chair Bothwell, uh, to, to answer Olia's question directly, all of the money is not earmarked for something specific yet. Uh, it will be either towards these designation reports or depending on the applications we get where we might want to peer review a peer review because we're uncomfortable with the findings. So it's not 100% accounted for, but it's planned for peer reviews of designation reports, peer reviews of heritage impact assessments that maybe we're not satisfied with and then additional support as required on an application basis. But because we don't know 100% what the applications are gonna look like this year, we can't earmark 100% of that money. I think that answers the question that was posed. Fair enough, but it also sounds like we're taking a bit of a different strategy on designation reports as well. So that's just added bonus for information. Thank you. Thank you, Antonetta. Um, 
So we're, we're going to move to the uh, business working group meetings, agenda item HD 2202. Um, there's some recommendations in that uh, report as well. Uh, how many members have had an opportunity to read the report um, and the attached work plan. I submitted, uh, what I did was I submitted, um, I think we got two pieces we need to really deal with here. So the recommendation, and I can have Antoinette or Bianca speak to it. Um, they don't really actually deal with um, finalizing the work plan that's attached as an appendix. So I think we kind of have to deal with that separate from the recommendations in this business meetings and working groups recommendation. Is that right, Bianca? Um, through Council Bothwell. Yeah, uh, we can deal, maybe we can go through the report and then talk about uh, adopting that work plan if everyone's comfortable with it, if um, they still want to work on the format. But I think based on the report, some of the new items was the highest voted by the community, the, the committee. So I think we could probably move forward with the report. And then if everyone's comfortable with the format, I only received Councillor Bothwell's um, comments. I'm also okay if everyone's comfortable with Council, Councillor Bothwell's proposal that we go with that one as well. So um, it's up to you which one you want to do first, but maybe it'll be helpful to do the report. Okay, let's go ahead and do the report and then we'll do the work plan separately. Sounds good. Okay, thank you. So um, staff uh, provided the following updates on the, staff would like to provide the following updates um, on the heritage portfolio. Um, I think it's really exciting to see some of these um, numbers here. Um, so I'm gonna go over them. I think it's a big, um, a big sign of how much work has been done. So it's exciting. Um, so this is a robust and evolving portfolio that pro active, proactively uh, protects invaluable heritage resources and has made significant strides towards the protection of heritage resources. So currently the town has 36 properties designated under part four of the Ontario Heritage Act with four additional ones currently within the notice of intention to designate phase of the designation process, which provides protections under the Ontario Heritage Act equivalent to those that are fully designated under part four. Um, the town also has 363 properties on the municipal register. Within the Grimsby Beach area we, and surrounding neighborhoods, we are uh, currently reviewing approximately 200 additional properties. And these are um, under review against the Ontario Regulation 906. So the town currently has a total of 403 properties with a status under the Ontario Heritage Act. With our goal of adding the notable properties to the Grimsby Beach area prior to the lifting of the interim control bylaw, these numbers are expected to increase once more. So if all 200 properties considered in the Grimsby Beach area are added to the register, the number of protected properties will now increase to over 600 properties. Heritage staff is on track to increase the number of heritage resources in the town from to 63% in a span of 18 months. Should council approve the proposed listed properties within the Grimsby Beach area and with the large mass inclusion undertaken in 2011, as well as the recent increase to designations and the recent designation, uh, recent designations, staff has made historic strides in conserving Grimsby's heritage. Um, this represents a change in properties with status under the Ontario Heritage Act from 220 to almost 600 properties with protection. The number of protected resources is expected to increase once again with a potential future HCD along the Main Street East Corridor. While a number of the heritage resources within the Main Street East Corridor are protected under Section 27, which is the Municipal Heritage Register, of the Heritage Act, upgrading their status to Part 4 will increase their level of protection on these resources and the associated streetscape. Now, it's important to mention that non-heritage related resources within the HCD will also now be added to the heritage portfolio and, and they are not currently represented in the heritage inventory. It is again important to note that the number of resources has continues to grow and thus the pressures and demands on staff continue to grow. Um, this, these types of pressures, pressures can be shown through uh, evaluation of heritage resources, ensuring they're being protected, monitoring of all the sites, um, future potential studies, HGDs, and uh, review of heritage impact assessments, heritage permits, um, heritage conservation plans, the list goes on and on. Um, 
And it's important to note that all properties with status under the Ontario Heritage Act require regular observation and intention and attention to ensure they are being properly re retained and conserved. Um, currently, staff is providing recommendations to the 403 heritage property members on a regular basis. Um, in the year of 2021, we did regular visual observations to over 400 properties and we conducted over 50 on-site heritage, cons heritage consultations. As the heritage portfolio continues to expand and with the priors of the committee now identified through our pri prioritization session, I believe it was in November, um, there's now an opportunity to create some working groups uh, to tackle some of the new items in, their, in the work plan. So based on the prioritizing session, staff would recommend the creation of the following two different working groups. So the first one would be outreach and marketing, and that group would focus on tour guides, information booklets, promotional material, and then ideas for community engagement. And looking at workshops to help um, heritage professionals be able to take care of their buildings and really enforce those best practices. And then once these working groups have conducted their research or uh, created their materials, we ask them to come forward to the committee with their recommendations on implementation. The second working group would be focused on resource protection. Um, so this working group would collect general and specific research pertaining to the heritage properties on the Municipal Heritage Register, uh, heritage properties of interest, and properties that are of commemorative value or commemorative interest. Uh, this group can also identify properties that are currently on the register that they think should be considered for designation, and then they can also consider properties that should be included on the Municipal Register. And then again, we'll invite that committee to give a presentation um, and then uh, provide recommendations on implementation. Um, and again, Heritage Committee can revise the name of the group if they like. Um, and staff are happy to provide materials. Uh, if you need like a step-by-step -step how to get started on research, happy to provide that. Uh, examples of what other municipalities have done, we can use those as well. Um, so we are proposing that um, since we have this opportunity, we would like to um, discuss larger goals quarterly and then utilize interim meeting dates to achieve these goals and priorities. Um, it will be during the business meetings that statutory items are addressed and reviewed. So I wanna note that in the event that a statutory item becomes urgent, we still have all of our regular meeting dates um, locked in and um, we can give updates to the committee that we'll be switching a working group meeting to a business meeting, and we can do that a 30 and 60 day increments due to the nature of statutory items. Um, staff will be present at the committee meetings for business, but they will not be in attendance at the working groups to ensure that we can focus on advancing um, proactive measures within the heritage portfolio. This will ensure that staff can leverage, leverage limited resources to focus on pressing needs and the most effective strategy to protect heritage. By creating these working groups, the committee will be able to support staff and advance heritage objectives by ensuring other elements of the heritage portfolio continue to progress. This will ensure that staff and the committee are better leveraging limited resources to, to focus on the most pressing needs and most effective strategies in place to protect heritage. In order to ensure that quorum is not met, the working group um, the working groups will consist of a maximum of five members, and I have lined it up so that there's four different working groups. So if everybody wants to be involved, um, we can divide up into the different working groups so that we never meet quorum. Um, so the implementation of these working groups will ensure that the committee will be pos well positioned to advance their goals and priorities, as well as support staff in the heritage work that they have been achieving and advancing. Through the, the utilization of interim working groups, the overall completion of the committee's priorities and reinforcing of staff time, sorry, refocusing of staff time on other heritage priorities, there will be a direct and meaningful impact to the protected heritage resources paired with meaningful support for the heritage homeowners. So we really hope you take that into consideration um, and just um, help us to continue to move all of these amazing um, pieces forward. So thank you. And I am happy to listen to any of your uh, uh, feedback and answer any questions. Thanks Bianca. So I uh, just wanna clarify 
um, for this meeting, we're not going to be setting the working groups. We're not going to be picking the people to go in the working groups. We can do that at the February meeting, correct, Bianca? And um, this is just so that we get uh, the council's endorsement as well to move forward with um, establishing those and moving on uh, and doing our um, terms of reference, right? <clears throat> Thank you, Councilor Bothell. We actually would like to utilize tonight to do some of that work um and implement them i'm gonna have uh peter share the screen the only reason that we're um thinking sooner is better than later is because it is an election year and we really want the committee to have an opportunity to accomplish some of their goals so this is what we're proposing and um if the committee would like some time to think about the two we can always arrange the groups via email um but ideally, we would like to implement it tonight if possible so that we can uh, advance both both key pieces of the portfolio. Okay, so what I'm hearing is if we vote on this recommendation as it's worded tonight, we're not going to have a February or a March meeting. Is that what I'm hearing? They would be working group sessions. And then in the event that there's statutory items, we would take it. But currently, there is no statutory items right now that would be need to go to February or March. You know, I, I, I just find it's 1030 at night and I don't know how we're going to establish what we haven't got council's approval to move forward with working groups um, for February as it is. So it, it's kind of a little awkward to start saying we're going to cancel a meeting when we haven't got council's endorsement of this anyway, but um, happy uh, Councilor Bothell to arrange who's in each group and things like that via email. It's just the implementation of these groups. And again, this is all just a recommendation to council and they'll ultimately say yes or no to this. And okay. I'll, the only other piece I was going to add is, it's completely normal. There's, a, I looked at about eight to 10 different municipalities and all of them have ranging um, meeting dates. And so this is something that a lot of other communities utilize as well. We wouldn't be the only one. So I'm going to open it up to questions on your report. Um, so Anne? I guess that's not really a question is for, well, maybe. Um, I, I don't like this idea at all. I'm gonna be honest. I I think that we, like the fact that we're still here at 1030 at night tells us that we need a monthly meeting that as a group. And I don't know that the working groups that don't have staff there are actually gonna be the best use of all of our time because we're volunteers too, right? So we, we it's just, I, I just, honestly, I, I just don't like this idea. I don't know if I'm the only one that thinks this, but. So just to just to and to clarify, so there's um, five recommendations in the motion in the in the motion. So if committee is not happy with the frequency of the business meetings, uh, item five that can be removed, uh, which would leave us with status quo as the calendar is currently set. But the rest of the recommendations would would then stand. So there's options to remove or to modify any of the recommendations that are before us tonight. So I'll leave that I'll leave that open for a committee to make motions or recommendations as they see fit. Olia. Thank you, Chair Bothwell. Um, just to add a little bit more, hopefully, depth to my thoughts on this. Um, I find the idea of um, whittling it down to working groups and then reducing the number of meetings um, flying in the face of transparency to the public. Um, I think also in the last two years of working through a pandemic, the experience has been um, replacing meetings with a whole bunch more emails flying around, which would be the alternative. Um, where this would be headed is extremely inefficient. And uh, I echo Anne's sentiments about the, the duration of today's meeting. And um, I don't see reducing that frequency, addressing that in any sense. I also think that um, it's setting a bad precedent, um, that it's much easier to leave the meetings as is and then cancel them as needed, rather than to cancel the meetings and then bring them back in as needed. That leaves a lot of room for interpretation. And you look at last year as an example, um, during the second year of the pandemic, there was a couple of months earlier in the year, which, which, which was canceled due to COVID closures. But then outside of COVID closures, you had meetings canceled in the summer anyhow. December is often not a meeting month. Um, so I think it's much easier to leave the meetings as is and cancel as needed rather than on the flip side, cancel them and then try and bring them back. We already have those dates committed in our calendars. Um, and I would suggest leaving it that way. I also take a different interpretation on it being an election year. 
that if we want to meet our priorities and our goals, we should be doubling down our efforts and not reducing the number of times that we gather. It's already a less efficient meeting forum to be doing this live with voting buttons, how much time is wasted muting and unmuting, and it would be even worse of it and, and, and a greater detriment and disservice to heritage to reduce the number of times that we gather already in this less than ideal medium. Uh, so I would strike the fifth clause altogether. I think similar to when Chair Bothwell and I formed a working group to draft up a rever revised terms of reference that this is additional work that we volunteer to do above and beyond meeting and I would view this no differently. Thank you. Okay, so I have a motion by, um, just want to see if I have a seconder to amend that to strike number five, if there's a, a seconder to strike number five from the recommendation. Uh, Anne? Okay, so we've got a mover and a seconder to strike number five as an amend amendment to the recommendation. Um, Antonetta, do you have something you want to say? I do. Thank you, Chair Bothwell. I appreciate what committee members are saying, but I, I can't ignore sort of how much has been accomplished. In 18 months, we've probably made up for 10 to 15 years of work that needed to be done in Heritage. We got Grimsby to where it needed to, to where it needs to be. So unequivocally, and from an evidence-based perspective, there are so many more properties that now we need to engage with all those property owners. Preparing for meetings where there's a statutory component, 100% staff will do that. That will never fall off the radar. The meetings will stay in place. The dates would be preserved. I think there was concern about the dates being preserved. A disservice to heritage. Frankly, given Bianca's update and everything we've accomplished in the last 18 months, to hear anything like a disservice to heritage is frankly, a, it's offensive to the extraordinary and historic work that we've been doing. We have been acknowledged by the National Trust, by CAP, for the monumental work that we've been doing here in Heritage. So to not even sort of acknowledge all of the positive, huge amount of work, and that correspondingly, when you add hundreds of properties to the register, that equals so much more staff time. So staff can prepare for these meetings at the detriment of Heritage, because we're updating on work that we're doing as opposed to everybody participating in one way or another. And we're not saying that work is gonna stop. In fact, what we're saying is if we don't meet when we don't have to, the work to protect heritage is accelerated and we can move forward on those designations. And we can also be mindful of the resource constraints that we have. A 63% increase in our register in 18 months is unheard of. The, the provincial and federal government reached out to us and said, how did you do that? We don't have a single municipality that has accomplished that in Ontario unless they've hired a professional to start their register from scratch. So some of the things that I'm hearing, transparency, disservice to heritage, uh, you know, I, I have to sort of step in and say that that would not be right to the staff who work diligently to bring you all the fantastic updates that you get and to move those monumental pieces of heritage that have been moved in the last 18 months. So I, I'm frankly you know, a, a little disheartened by what I hear tonight. And I think that we've proved without a doubt that we have moved heritage in the right direction more than anybody could have imagined. And what staff is saying, and this is a staff driven report is that now we need time to create relationships with all those property owners, update internal documents, create better internal communications, standardizing emails and communicating with heritage property owners, and we need time to do that. And if there are no statutory things, which is what this committee advises council on, then let's reduce the frequency of the meetings so that working groups can happen in their place. So, you know, I think we, we need to also acknowledge the wonderful work that's happened here and be sensitive to the needs of staff and the, and the resource constraints that this is. And, and there's evidence showing how much the register has increased. That all amounts to more work, more heritage permits, more reviews, more appeals, and we need time to do that work. That's what you heard tonight. And it, it, I think it would be a disservice to not acknowledge that huge, tremendous lift. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Dunstall. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I just wanted to say that uh, being a, uh, 
heritage property owner, uh, I uh, wanted to let everybody know that I bought the old fire hall in 2011. And at that time, uh, and I was told it was the oldest uh, uh, civic building or uh, town-owned building at one time. Uh, it was built in 1890. And it had no designation on it in 2011. And it's a sweet little building. And now it has a designation on it. So I, when I saw this report tonight and how much work that this, that this uh, department has done and staff have done, I, I was flabbergasted because just not too long ago, there wasn't a lot of heritage activity going on. And it's, it's incredible what we've accomplished. And I know we don't like change, and this is a change, but I, I think we should listen to our director and maybe give it a try and see if, if this would go uh, in the right direction. Uh, the little fire hall has a great history. I mean, it was uh, originally the fire hall, then it became the fire hall and jail. The jail was added in 1914, and it's, it's still there to this day. There's two jail cells in the back of the old fire hall. It became a, a library upstairs at one point. It then became the police station. And back in 1977, and I don't know why it didn't happen, but it was, it was going to be de demolished in 1977 that when the police moved out of that uh, facility. It never happened, thank goodness, but maybe, maybe the Historical Society could tell us what happened to it, but it, it's got a beautiful history. Uh, so, I mean, those are the kind of things that we might be uh, able to focus on if we have these working committees is finding out more about our history in this wonderful town that we live in. So uh, I, I like the idea of the working committees and I think we should uh, maybe uh, give it a shot. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dunstall. So I think that if uh, the motion in front of us is just to strike number five, but that would still continue with the working groups. So that's that's not stopping the working groups, just to clarify. Um, did I see, I thought I saw some more hands about the report, uh, Pamela? Thank you. Um, what I'm hearing is staff is asking for us to do um, some of the work and I'm all for it. Um, I believe most committees like this do a great deal of work. I know years ago, um, many, many years ago, I used to get um, a regular visit from a gentleman that sat on the Heritage Committee and they did a lot of community engagement and different projects. And I'm all in support of our staff. And I do agree, these meetings likely take a great deal of time of prep for them. So that likely needs to be maybe looked at um, if their time could be used more. And as a heritage homeowner, um, I do think heritage homeowners have a right to be able to reach out and have the resources available to them um, that they can communicate and engage and ask questions. Um, I've reached out to Bianca over the years, the last couple of years, especially, and it's been about resources for repair work on my home. And she's been phenomenal with helping me um, get connected with somebody. So I do think these working groups um, would benefit us actually in the community. So I'm all for them. Okay, so again, the working groups are items one to four, which if the motion as amended goes forward would still take place. So that's and just- I don't, it, like I said, if the meetings are too much, then likely we need maybe lead to look at rescheduling um, if it's not going, so it's not every month. So, okay, so we have a motion anyway now for an amendment to the report um, in front of us, um, and that's what we'll speak to. So, Sarah, you have any questions? Uh, thank you. I, I just hearing what the committee is saying, I'm not sure if it's appropriate to maybe ask modifying the meeting schedule. Maybe we meet the business every other month and our working groups alternating months. I'm not sure if there's room to maybe play around with how many times we meet as a whole to discuss business and how many times 
we meet to discuss the working groups, but just a suggestion I thought I would throw out there. Okay, um, Mark. I, I think 10.30 or 10.40 at night is a bad time to be starting to make decisions about this, to be honest with you. This is my third meeting. None of them have been less than three to three and a half hours. None of them. We get 600 pages of stuff to read on Thursday or Friday. We're volunteers too, and I understand staff is busy. But we're, we're trying to do our bit to help. I support totally the work that Bianca has done on listing things in the register. I actually downloaded the register, all 365 properties. One of them is mine. It just means I'm listed. Um, if anybody comes and looks at the front of my house, it's not going to pass any kind of litmus test at all. Um, but I understand the whole process. I, the fact that we're having this discussion at 20 to 11 at night, three times in a row, tells me that we have an issue. And, that, and that's that's all I'd like to add. I'm willing to work in a working group um, and, and to, to it reiterate, um, we are volunteers as well. We're doing our best. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. So uh, if there's no further questions, what I'm going to ask um, Peter, uh, the motion that we're going to read will be as amended. Um, does that make sense, Peter? So the recommendation will be uh, items one to four, and I'll read those. And then if uh, committee, we can vote on that. And if committee doesn't vote on the amended recommendation, we go back to the original recommendation, which is with all five points. Okay. So can I have, so I'm going to read the recommendation is number one, that staff report HG 2202 recommendation report heritage committee business meetings and working groups dated generally be received and two that the committee recommend the establishment of working groups with a maximum of five members per working group so as to avoid quorum. And three that these working groups consist of members of the heritage community advisory committee for a specific purpose of advancing their priorities and goals outlined with their work plan. And four that these working groups start in February and end with this count term of council. Can I have a mover and seconder? I had one. I've got Olia and I've got Ann uh, for that. So all in favor of that amended recommendation? Can we have a recorded vote, please? Sure, sure can. Can I have a recorded Thank vote, you. Peter? Thank you. And can we just ask, are we we're just voting right now to amend it and then we're gonna vote on the amended? We're voting on the recommendation as amended, which is which is with number five removed. And if this goes through uh, with items one to four, then the amendment will carry. And if it's defeated, we'll go back to the original recommendation motion, which is all five. Bianca? I, I just wanted to add something quickly, just reiterating the staffing constraints. I do not know how we will do 12 meetings plus working groups. I don't know how we will manage to review all that material on top of the workload. So the idea was to have the working groups, all four working groups, and then the meetings. And I just, I, I literally do not know how I will review material on top of this massive um, portfolio. So I just wanted to put that out there just for some perspective. And um, a side note to uh, Mark's comment about the agenda, if we had those meeting times um, kind of spread out a little, we would have time to have those agendas up earlier. It's literally um, when we're reviewing all those, re those reports as well on top of the massive workload and we're doing our absolute best. But if we had more time in between to utilize for that kind of things, we'd be happy to get those agendas out earlier and compromise with that as well. Thank you, uh, Olia. Quick, because uh, I'm sorry. This just keeps growing lakes. Um, first off, most recently, Bianca, I've been crying and moaning about agendas being released two nights before meeting dates for all four years that I've been on this committee. Three, sorry, years, and it's never happened. And I realized why. It's because there's only a statutory requirement that it's released 48 hours before the meeting. So before. Antonetta joined and before all of this uplifting and don't get me wrong adding properties I appreciate all of it don't don't say that because I'm not thanking you every five seconds that I'm not grateful all I'm saying is we have a different interpretation of how this work is going to get done all I'm saying is that before all of this stuff was added in terms of properties and being listed and added 
we still couldn't get agenda sooner, no matter how many times I asked. I have a hard time believing that it will happen now. I apologize. I'm sorry. I have a hard time believing that. And I, I, I do believe that you have a lot of work to do. We're volunteers. We're willing to do more. I've never refused to do working groups. I've done one previously. I would do one again. We have a different interpretation of how we're going to get to the finish line. That's all it is. And I want it on record that I am grateful for what's been done. And I am grateful for what's been added. But I'm not going to thank you every five seconds. I'm a volunteer. I'm not getting thanked every five seconds. Uh, Antonetta. Wow. Councillor Bothwell, through you, Madam Chair, I'm just looking at, at at my team here, and I'm disheartened to hear the way Olia is speaking to us. No one is asking for thanks. This is our job. We do it willingly. We go above and beyond. Everything that we have brought forward has been staff initiated. Look yep. at Bianca's face. I know. Uh, okay. Okay. This is um, awful. No, okay. it's not okay, okay. Councillor Bob. It's not okay. It is it's not okay. okay. It's not okay. We need respect for our staff and we need respect for, for where we're at with this motion. So it's not, it's not personalities. It's not work. It's not um, the committee against staff. This is just a motion to determine whether or not we want to continue with the frequency of business meetings as they exist, or if we want to adopt a new, a new method, which has been proposed in the recommendation. So I think we've got to uh, we're going to pull ourselves back to the motion. We're going to do the recorded vote. Um, we've heard um, the staff's the staff's position on the rationale, which has been very strong as to why they support item number five. The motion, though, amended. Chair, yes. Chair Bianca said that if five isn't included, she can't conduct the other four. So if you're going to reject five, reject all five. She can't do the working groups and still meet monthly. So the working groups are not a staff led item, right? Is that not what I understood? But if you recall, she was saying she'd have to prepare for them. I didn't People think require staff, staff whole, resources. I didn't think staff were going to be, uh, staff were only going to be available if needed, but the working groups were working independently. But, and staff would not have to devote time to them. I disagree with that. I mean, we've been doing it next, Dev. You're always going to have to pull off staff. I think if you're going to reject five, reject all five. So uh, respectfully, um, CEO Schlang, the, the recommendation report in front of us, there's an amended motion on the floor for a recorded vote. So the mem so it's- We cannot, she's made it clear, she cannot resource the, the four recommendations if you don't change the fifth. So I'll go back to the mover and the seconder, Olia and uh, Anne. So the CAO is recommending that instead of just striking number five, that we vote um, in full on the recommendation. And if the committee is not uh, supportive of uh, all five recommendations, then they would vote it down. And if they are in support of all five recommendations, they would approve it. So do you, would you wanna stick with your amendment to strike five only, or do you want to move to just voting on the full five recommendations as a whole? Um, I guess I was the mover, so the question is being posed to me. Is that right? Yes, please. My understanding was that meeting frequency would be reduced to quarterly so that staff would not be constrained or otherwise encumbered by meeting during the working group meeting months. Now I'm hearing from CAO Schlang that there would be staff commitment even though there are working groups like i'm not i'm not clear based on what this staff report is saying in terms of reducing workload on staff that that where is the needle being moved on alleviation from staff resources if we still need to bother you for working groups i was interpreting that to mean as staff would prefer to only have quarterly meetings so that they're not encumbered by the committee off doing working group activities in the intervening months. That it can maybe clarify, yeah. having done yeah. some working yeah. groups before, there's still staff support needed in the working groups. Yeah. Bianca has made it clear that there's no way she could do the four without the fifth. Okay. And your comments, Olia, prior to that, if we went to quarterly meetings, we could probably get agendas out earlier. And you should apologize for those comments you made earlier. 
I will apologize, Bianca. Honestly, you're the only common thread that's been on this group since the staff turnover that's taken place. And I hold you with a really high torch. I obviously well, did, not not how you spoke. I, I, I did not convince anyone that of that. How you spoke. Can I finish my apology, please? Let let Bianca let uh, Olia finish, please. Bianca. Bianca, I'm being honest from the bottom of my heart here. I do appreciate what's been what you have accomplished with and, and in spite of the turnover that swirled in and around you. I obviously didn't make that clear. The the clearest point I wanted to make is that we appear to have a different interpretation of how we're going to take this to the finish line over the balance of the term of this council. Uh, so I apologize for making you feel uncomfortable. That's not my intention. All I wanted to make clear was that in the interest of transparency to the public, uh, public meetings are, I think, is what's best. And in order to preserve transparency, if we were to go to the route of working groups, um, there would, I think, in the interest of transparency, still be required some type of update to the public that would be frequent, more frequent than quarterly. Um, so I don't want to repeat myself. Uh, Bianca, I'm sorry. I sincerely did not mean to offend you. I appreciate everything that you have accomplished in spite of what's swirled in and around you the last few years. And I thank you for your dedication. So I guess um, we're just, uh, and so now we're going back to um, the, whether or not the mover and the seconder, uh, Uli, if you're willing to um, drop your amendment or stick with your amendment to remove strike number five. I'll drop it. I don't, I don't want to be seen as the thorn in everyone's side, which I mean, I will be anyways, but I will, I will drop it. If that's what Bianca is saying she needs, then yeah, I'm going to support her. So what we'll do is we'll vote on the recommendation as it stands one to five. Um, and if the committee does not support the recommendation as it stands, then we have to come back with a different plan at another meeting. So, um, so we'll drop the, Peter, we're good with that, dropping the amendment and moving back to the original recommendation and doing a recorded vote on it. Yes, thank you through you, Councillor Bothwell. So to the original amendment, I understand the amendment's been withdrawn. Uh, so it would be to the uh, original motion. Okay, so can we do a recorded vote, please, on the original motion then? Yes. Anne? Uh, nay, no. Pamela? Yes. Councillor Dunstall? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Mark? No. Brian? Yes. Kate? No. Olia? Yes. Mayor Jordan? No. Councillor Bothwell? No. That is defeated. So what that means, Peter, is that all the recommendations are defeated. The motion is defeated. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah, the resolution was defeated. That'll be captured in the minutes. Okay. So are we... Okay. We've got the work plan to do. It's uh, 10 minutes to 11. Normally, our meetings don't extend past 11 without a motion of the committee to do so. Um, I, I'm, I'm, su I'm suggesting that we defer the work plan, the activity report, and the 100-year celebration to the next meeting, which is February 8th, I believe. Um, can I have a mover and seconder to do that? Mark and Brian. So we're gonna defer the remainder of the business uh, to the next Heritage Committee meeting. Um, and Peter, can you please confirm, is that February the 8th? I just don't have my calendar in front of me. Through you, Chair, uh, let me just pull up the agenda, sorry, the calendar here. That is correct, yes, February 8th is the uh, 
council approved schedule. Okay, so uh, we're gonna conclude our meeting for today and uh, the next meeting will be February the 8th and this meeting is now adjourned. Okay, thank you. <laughs>